It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, center stage, Republican candidates holding their fourth presidential debate and on the attack. I love all the attention, fellas. Thank you for that. <laughs> Donald Trump skipping the event again. The fifth guy who doesn't have the guts to show up and stand here. We're live with the latest. Then we're beaming. Oh, to wow. The top to the beam. 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 Recreating one of the most iconic photos in American history. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. All the way at the top of 30 Rock. And simply the best. Hi, Barbie. We're counting down the top movies and shows of 2023. Truman needs to know what's next. Two. What's next? One. So did your favorites make the list? Scared him. We'll find out in Pop Star today, Thursday, December 7th, 2023. I deserve congratulations. It's a carefree Christmas from Rochester, Minnesota. Celebrating 10 years of marriage. From Randallstown, Maryland. Yes. From Vermont, Illinois. On a mother-daughter trip. <laughs> Shout out to my friends at the University of Utah. In Salt Lake City. We made our first trip to New York. From Fargo, North Dakota. Super blue. Sending love to my students back at North Central High School. In Spokane, Washington. On our honeymoon. From Big Lake, Texas. From Kent, Georgia. Took our first flight to be here today. From Wilmington, North Carolina. Here to celebrate Parks' first Christmas. We're back, 814, with a brand new attraction at the top of 30 Rock. It gives visitors the chance to recreate this iconic photo, construction workers dangling over the city as they built 30 Rock back in 1932, when the five of us were invited to be the very first guests. Check it out, guys. We're going up there oh, to wow. the top of the rock. Yeah. All the way to the top. You know what's up there? What? The beam. Let's go oh. beam. Oh. We're getting on the beam. It was just a short walk across the street from Studio 1A. Wait. Yeah, let's go. Going up. To be the very first guests to beam ourselves up to the latest experience in Rockefeller beam. Plaza. Beam. To the beam. 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 The beam refers to a steel beam that became part of one of the most iconic photographs in American history. 11 iron workers dangling more than 850 feet high above the city, casually eating lunch. The construction of Rockefeller Center is complete and John D. Rockefeller Jr. will drive the last rivet. The year was 1932, the height of the Great Depression, and this construction project, eventually known as Rockefeller Center, put more than 40,000 people to work when jobs were hard to come by. The photo, called Lunch Atop a Skyscraper, came to symbolize American resilience and an ode to the American worker. Oh, here we go! Get ready! And we were on the way to pay our own tribute of sorts to the 69th floor of 30 Rock, to that very same location the original photo was taken. This new adventure is called The Beam. Is that The Beam? This is it? That's a beautiful piece of metal right there. And soon we were strapped in. This is like being on a ride at Universal. Yeah. Hands up! Yeah. Come on, let's go! Because to recreate that famous photo, we have to be lifted high into the air. Here we go. So good. And then something we don't expect. We turn. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh baby. Carson, how are we doing? We're doing good. SG. Oh, wow. Now we go out over the. We're not really. No, it does not. No, it doesn't. And, oh, yes. We turn again. Oh, oh now wow. we're back. This is oh. So great. Yeah. oh, that's great. And now we're in position to try and capture that famous moment. We felt like we were beaming, but something was missing. If those brave iron workers were having lunch, so were we. Would you want to eat lunch up here? We were going back up. So what do you guys think about this experience? Would you like to meet at this place for lunch again? Sure. <laughs> I think we should do the show from up here. I think it's a great lunch spot. Mm -hmm. I think it's perfect. Carson, the how is, are you? The view is tremendous. Mm -hmm. You're all right? It really makes you think about hardworking Americans back almost 100 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And the idea what this, build, this yeah. building is still standing. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I got news for the people at home watching this. The beam underneath us, not that wide. No. No, it's not. Not that wide. No. 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 But this is special. Mm -hmm. Go back in time. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. again Cheers. in 80 years. Cheers. There you go. 
Wow. Very cool. Oh, that was fun. I'm a little nervous, yeah. I, yeah. That I don't that was like a good heights. deal for you. I don't like heights or rides. Wow. Yeah. And, of any kind. and I did that, and I'm glad I did, because if you come to the New York area, you should do it, because it really does put you kind of in that spirit of, of uh, you know, the time. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and just the view alone. Yeah. You know, just really get that, that, you get that, that extra few feet gives you a whole different perspective. Yeah. yeah. So if you are making your way here to the Big Apple during the holidays, especially, cool. add the beam yes. to your to-do list. Yes. Yes. Really had, that, had that gone out, though, that would have been great. Yeah, that that would have been, been great. great. Families no. should do it. It could be their Christmas gift. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And oh, everyone's yeah. belted in, so everyone's yeah, you're totally in and you're safe. You're not dangling like with 800 right. feet below It's totally safe. Totally safe. Completely. Yes. Well, Hoda had to leave a little early. She did. But yeah. best time of the morning show, I said. For no, no, she's got a little school thing. Little Don't, take oh, okay. Don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. She'll be okay. back for the fourth hour. Back for the fourth hour. Protesting pop right now. No, no. Heck no. Pop it's good. It's a good she, because today. it's the best time of the morning. Okay, good. Come on. Thank you. She's well, here for that. IMDb out with their big year ender now. It's some of the ranks Love for these. the best of 2023. We're talking about what uh, the online entertainment database company has dropped as the 10 best movies and TV series based on web page views. Let's take a look at the films first, starting at 10. The Flash, hmm. Killers of the Flower Moon, Across the Spider-Verse. Oh. We've got Five Nights at Freddy's, Super Mario Brothers, John Wick Chapter oh. 4, The New Little Mermaid, Galaxy, oh, yeah. okay. uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. Barbie was number two, and the number one movie was... Oppenheimer? Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? Chances are near zero. Near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Zero would be nice. That's it. The Christopher yeah. Nolan film Oppenheimer grabbed that top spot. Remember the, it was a great the film. Barbie Heimer? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oppenheimer. Around that weekend? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it was true. They it paid off great. one You saw it there. twice. I've seen it twice. Saw it yeah. uh, regular and then in uh, IMAX. Unbelievable. Yeah. The TV shows. Let's get to those okay. here. Best of the year. Gen V, The Bear, Ted Lasso, Fall of the House of Usher, One Piece, The Mandalorian, Black Mirror, Succession, Ashoka, and then this dramatic thriller at number one. Somewhere out west, they're working on a cure. I think what really impressed them was the fact that I didn't turn into a monster. If she so much as twitches, <laughs> don't. <clears throat> okay. More zombies like Walking Dead? Oh boy. Yeah, kind of. It's, it's, it's good. It's, it's fantastic. It's very good, but it's... It's a little too dark. It's funny. It's like singing on TV. Remember, like, Idol was big, and then yeah. we came out with a voice. They're like, oh, not another singing competition. Right. But, like, people love them. People watch them. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing like zombies. Like, well, Apocalypse. we're not over the zombie craze. You can't kill them all. Right, though. Yeah, no, when it's good, it's good, right? Or zombies. Like the voice. Like the How voice. about a zombie voice? The last of us. <laughs> we had that, but Blake's not there anymore. <laughs> Uh, Last of Us on that. HBO, Max, that stars Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey. Yeah. All right, let's move on to Bradley Cooper. Yesterday, the A-lister was showing off to New Yorkers his brand new gig. Afternoon, breadheads. Come on down. Get a cheesesteak. Here we go. He's a natural. Yep, that's the Oscar nominee, Bradley Cooper, going back to his Pennsylvania roots, doling out some Philly cheesesteaks from a food truck mm. called Danny and Coop's. They were in the West Village, I believe, yesterday here in New York. Social media, quickly as you can imagine, exploding with videos showing the actor working up a sweat there 
Uh, so this is a warning today. If you're in New York and you're looking for a food truck, keep your eyes peeled oh, for an Oscar winner. Wow. It could be him, wow. maybe day two out oh, there. Cool. Next up, The Devil Wears Prada. 18 years later, former co-stars Anne Hathaway and Emily Blunt reunited for Variety's Actors on Actors series. The two looking back on the iconic and highly quotable film. Uh, when the, and they weren't able to resist cracking up over this legendary line. Okay, this is one of my favorites. Oh, I'm sorry, do you have some prior commitment? Do you have some hideous skirt convention to go to? <laughs> some hideous skirt convention you have to go to. I would laugh all the time because I just felt I was so horrible to you most of the time <laughs> in this movie. And it was your little face. Horrible to her. Wow. Her face. character was treated poorly by the boss in that movie. Yeah, right? well, you know what? It was like she was yeah. poorly treated, yeah, so it was slowed the, down. That's a great, great movie. movie. Yeah. Great movie. Next up, we got Christmas at the Opry. Tonight, the star studded holiday special set to premiere on NBC. We've got an exclusive first look at host Winona Judd singing a Christmas classic alongside Kelly Clarkson. The Grand Ole Opry is the most iconic stage in country music, and it's magical any time of year, but Christmas is when it really shines. He knows if you've been bad or good, so he could come Oh, you better watch out. So that Kelly Clarkson's working hard this holiday season. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's the, filling in for Lester tonight. Oh, is she really? <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. She's out of tree lighting. Mm -hmm. She's doing nightly news tonight. Yeah. Sure. Omnipresent. Yeah. What can't that Kelly do? Uh, the two-hour <laughs> special performances, Brenda Lee, Chrissy Metz, Mickey Guyton, all that happening here tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern on NBC. Of course, it'll stream on Peacock if you miss it, so be sure and check it out. And finally, Pantone. It's time to announce oh. the next color oh. of the year. They're giving us an exclusive pop star sneak peek. You guys ready for the new yeah, color right. 2024? What is it? Drum roll, please. The 2024 Pantone color of the year is Peach Fuzz. Huh? Really? Peach Fuzz. What's Stop that? laughing, Craig. The What's color that? Is, that's right. The Color Institute describes Peach Fuzz, Uncle Al, as a compassionate, oh. nurturing, soft peach shade conveying a heartfelt kindness. Oh, huh. I like this it. This also oh. marks Pantone's 25th color of the year anniversary. And if you're wondering what it looks like in the real world, we've got a little peach fuzz assortment right here. <laughs> Do they and choose it because that's what everyone likes this color, or they're I saying don't know. you it's going to be it's the going to color be everywhere. Of the year. It's the color of the year. I think they're I sort think. of this year. It's, it's going to be. be it's going to be this everywhere. will be the color you see. That's okay. right. I like it. For those yeah. of you, that beige isn't too exciting. Yeah, peach fuzz, <laughs> number one peach color. Fuzz. You know the number two color of the year was? What was it? Taylor Swift. Shut up. Oh, it smells good. Come to the list. Wait, she's... it's got a scent. Yeah. yeah. Here. All right. You guys want to smell peachy? Oh, that does. That, that, that smells it's okay. It's lovely. Here. Oh, that's Merry cute. Christmas. When we come back, recipes. No peaches in the recipes, though, but recipes okay. nonetheless for a perfect treat to serve at your next holiday party. Oh, some sliders. Some sliders. tasty little sliders. Oh, oh peach pack, sliders. Pack a lot no of peach flavor. In that. No, no mm. peach. After local news. Mm.
good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming to this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage, liberated? We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. Boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. Oh, we are back, 843 now with Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post. And folks, the clock is ticking. If you are still looking to check some folks off your holiday list, we've got you covered. Our Shop Today team has scored exclusive deals on every product that's being featured this morning. So you know what to do. Scan that QR code right now before we dig in. This browser extension I know. is all the rage. Yes, we're getting up to 30% off all the deals you see here today. But if you want even more awesome savings, it is the Shop Today Savings browser extension. You can save big on over 40,000 different brands. And Craig, it is so easy to use. We've got some B-roll here. Yeah. Go to today.com slash savings. You just click, you shop as usual, yeah. and then you save. I mean, coupons and savings yeah. automatically end up at checkout. Okay. And so we've got six amazing deals here. But guess what? If you download the extension, yeah. you're going to get access to 50 more exclusive deals. So Just in time for the holidays. Yeah, so so download it ASAP. Cashmere, always a great okay, gift. Okay, let's start big. This deal is incredible. This is a Kenneth Cole cashmere oh. chunky sweater. Feel that? It is so that soft. That is soft. Right? That is soft. Well, guess what? That's nice. We're getting, and normally this is $300 retail. Wow. Today we're getting it for $29.94. Probably just sold out right I now. I right can't there. get over it. The camel is going in my cart right after the show. And so you've also got 35% off site-wide. Okay. So that's incredible. And if you're looking to gift some jewelry, this could be an option. 30% off select bobble bar earrings. We love this brand. I mean, look at these. I mean, these are really on trend. The chunky hoops, I've been wearing them all year. So we've got 35% off those statement earrings and also little cool huggies. So this is great for the jewelry lover. A little birdie told me that this next brand oh is a chassis post gosh, favorite. I and they're customizable. These, yes, feel these little customized blankets. Nice. Aren't these adorable? Yeah. And so this is from a brand called House of Rams. And they come in four sizes, baby, big kid, little kid, and adult. So, okay. like, the whole gang can get together, cuddle up, and watch uh, holiday movies. And this is a huge deal, 30% off. So, Craig, normally these start at not $29. Yeah. Today, around $20. What? So, how fun is that? Okay. Okay. So, you can... This is if you need a perfect blowout. Yeah. So, See, you know, you're, you're surprised I knew that, right? I am surprised. Yeah. And, you know, Shark is known for their great vacuums. Yes. Well, they're also known for this incredible flex style so this is a six in one styling tool so check it out it can be a little hair dryer yeah. or you just oh, twist it and so it comes it, oh, with five different attachments Wow! and it's even got you know that auto curl yeah. it comes with two of those auto curls that styles your hair on its own and this is just genius and so it's six in one uh, normally it's 299. We get 30 percent off for 209. So I know that's still you know an investment, yeah. but fans say you know this is six and one, right? Seems like six a deal. and one and salon quality at home. Full disclosure, I picked this up. I thought it was like one of those old school pins from elementary school. Have you school. ever seen anything cooler? Mm -hmm. So this is from Alley Oop, which is a beloved brand. This is the four in one pen pal. So there are four different types of makeup mm -hmm. in this. So you click it. Oh. oh, you got an eyeliner. Click it again. You got a lip liner. Click it again. It's wow. a highlighter. Look at, look at Savannah's, Savannah's mouth. Like, it. Click it one more time. It is a brow pencil, Stop. and this is viral. It's 470 million TikTok. Wow. Videos, and we're getting 35% off. So normally it's $25. Yeah, put that in there. Right? There and this go. is my man. Tiny there you go. Thank you. That's so just turned into steals and deals. Savannah, it fits in your steals. pocket, <laughs> and yeah. it's great for travel. Right, what, so we're getting this for $16, normally $25. What about here, Chess? What okay, do we have here? Mark and Graham. We love Mark and Graham because you can brand. monogram yes. pretty much anything from, you know, little pup sweaters, monogram pup sweaters. How cute are these beanies? I mean, luxurious scarves. Even golf club covers. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, this would be great for Carson. Right? So good for Carson. And these start at $17.99, and you're getting free shipping, free gift wrap. I, 
I can't tell you guys how many deals. Look you got to go. Essie, I got you something else, too. <laughs> yes. It is your lucky day. Oh, that's cute. A little, oh, Esh yeah. Opry Ski. Right. Cute. Today.com slash savings. That browser extension yeah. is going to unlock. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, wow. Wow. They're saying put it on. I take deals. one of those hair dryers, too. Just just really, thank you. Just I'm just saying. <laughs> Look at that. There you go. Oh, Merry I Christmas. don't even ski, but I operate ski, you know? <laughs> Merry <laughs> Christmas. Ski. Jesse, thank you. Thanks to our model as well. Uh, <laughs> to get these deals, again, scan that QR code. We should note we have over 50 more exclusive deals. If you download that extension at today.com slash savings that Chas was just talking about, that's where you go to get the extension. Mr. Daly. Chef Josh Capon here with the uh, with the morning wake up call with the beer and the sliders and all sorts of good holiday stuff. If you're having a party, we're gonna we're gonna make it. Are you rocking? What are you? I'm what? rocking. I'm excited. I'm moving. We're shaking. Literally in, it's early in the morning. Rocking. But first, this is today on NBC. Don't do that. Let's you go. Do? Here, you need this more night. Yeah, right. back with another holiday edition of Today Food on the Menu. Tasty sliders, perfect for those holiday parties. And joining us now, Josh Capon. He's a globally acclaimed chef and restaurateur. Did you write that? Is that your I did, but you, it, it sounds That's beautiful, good. I got to tell you. Pretty good. Uh, also, Las Vegas, if you're there, and who doesn't want to go to Las Vegas right now, Josh is opening up his first namesake restaurant, Capon's Burgers, Fries, and Shakes. It's opening up inside the new beautiful Fountain Blue in Las Vegas. Tell me about that, Chef. That's well, let me tell you something. Some, people, you that some people get their name in lights in Vegas, as you can see from that picture. I got my name on the floor, yeah. but I could not be any more grateful and appreciative to be part of the Fountain Blue. No, that's a whole thing. It's been happening forever. property to open in Vegas in 10 years. Jeff Sulfur and his team have created something very special. That's a good enough reason to just go out to Vegas. But burgers, fries, and shakes. I mean, it's a limited These menu. These are a few of my favorite <laughs> things. Chef, you you got to nail them, though. What, what does it take to make a you good slider? Well, let's start. We're going to make some holiday sliders, All right? right? Let Special me know. holiday sliders. What can I do? Um, tenders, right? Yeah. Most importantly, season your buttermilk, right? Pepper, mustard, salt, a little bit of hot sauce in there as well. Always season every component of the dish. We're going to mix that up a little bit. Right. What is this going into? Buttermilk? Buttermilk, or? right? Yeah. Helps break down the kind of fat in the, in the chicken tenders. Yeah. Also tenderizes them a little bit and adds a ton of flavor, right? Then we take our flour. Once again, I hope you saw that. We got all different spices and herbs in you here. Gotta, you got to season, season the flour. Everything, right? right? Season. We're going to take those yep. right into here, got it. right? With the tongs. Yep. We got some already marinated. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Right? Okay. And what I'm all about, I'm all about the double dredge. So once you get them in once, double. right? Double dredge, Put always a double the dredge. Back in the flour. Wow. Back in the flour. That's not a double back dip. Out again. Double dip. Back in the flour. There you go. Look at this guy. He's a machine over here, yep. I tell you. Put me then to work right from the flour. Yep. Right? Boom. Boom. Put it Make in. sure your oil is nice and hot, right? Watch this. 
You see that? If you don't see those bubbles, you're doing something wrong. All right. Make sure oil is hot enough. Frying How is hot not is bad that? as What's long that? as you have 350. And you don't want to overcrowd it, Chef? You don't want don't to overcrowd, overcrowd it. We do two, Come Chef. Come on, Roki. You know Chef what's going on in twice. Here. Don't overcrowd the pan. Maintain the temperature. Yep. Then, Carson, we're going to take some no of your chicken hands, everybody. favorite blue cheese <laughs> dressing. Love it. Add some blue cheese. Add some celery. Got it. While you're doing that, we have our crispy chicken tenders over here. Are we here. in a rush? Why are we rushing? No, nah, we like to move. <laughs> we got another slider. We got another slider. We got to hit the casino. I'll tell you in the morning. We got some sliders to make over there as well. Savannah, when was the last time you were in Las Vegas? Have you been there? Oh, Last wow. weekend. Craig. Oh, you were just there? Yeah, I went and it was amazing. And if I had known about your restaurant, well, well Wednesday, listen, listen. Capon's Burgers, Shakes, and Fries opens up. Well, that would be the that's Fountain Blue. Oh, the Fountain Blue Grand Opening is December thirteenth. Okay. All right. And next time you're in Vegas, you better come to the Fountain. Oh, Blue. you come know up. I will. You're not too. staying any place else. No, I'm telling you right not. now. Right. I will come find you and pull you out of the hotel room. <laughs> Give me a little blue cheese wow. on the little starter bun. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Put that what do you down. Want? A little blue I'll cheese be there. on the yeah. starter bun. I got you. I got you. Yep. Right? Yes, chef. You want to just gently coat these tenders in your favorite hot sauce. A little butter never hurt when the hot sauce. What kind of bun are you doing? You're not treating the bun up. We heat the bun. This is fantastic. A little toasted bun over there, right? This toasted bun. How is it? Fantastic. You so gotta good. try this. You know what it is? Right? It's like a buffalo chicken wing. You want to build it? Bill, come on. Okay, got it. Always for Carson. I got it, chef. I got it. You remember when we were short order cooks back in Houston back in the day? Well, those were the days. Days, Those are the days. Look Let's at that. Not Come talk on. About that. No, what no, happened no, at Houston's no, no. stays at Houston's. Yes, that is All right. for sure true. Now, what are you doing with the onions here? Oh, this is the second slider. We are moving on. Slider that was number a Buffalo two. Billy that we're going to be right, featuring. This, one. this is the smoke gotcha. show. Get it? Smoke show out of Vegas? Yeah. I got it. A lot of smoke shows out in Vegas. Well, Female and male. In this one. If that's so first, we're making our bacon onion jam. We got some caramelized onions. We're going to fold in some bacon. My co chef is taking the rest of the day off. He is not eating over there. Don't forget your beer over there. A little bit of maple syrup. I don't think I've ever had a a, a little bit of Worcestershire. A little bit of chili pepper, right? Make this ahead of time. Okay. Cook it down. Nice little bacon onion jam. I loved the bacon onion cheeseburger growing up, mm -hmm. but I hated those two slices of bacon coming off the yep. top. They came out in one bite. Yeah. Yep. So now we make it into a little jam. Mm -hmm. A little secret oh. sauce. Everybody's secret sauce. Yeah. Mayo. Ketchup. Yep. Relish. relish. A little bit of mustard. What kind yes. of mustard was that? I do a little half Dijon or a little half yellow uh, mustard. Uh, right? A little half and half. You hot? Right? Oh, uh, make this, keep this in your it. fridge all the time. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Oh, you're work. on fire, you're I work. tell you. Look at going to work. Got a little bite? So I absolutely good. love it. I love it too. Right? A little, a little capon schmear on both sides. Both sides. Yeah. Both sides. Right? A little bacon jam on both sides. What's capon schmear? Capon schmear. Yeah. 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 Most importantly, That's American cheese. That's bacon jam jelly deal here. Yeah. Jam. Remember Teddy Jam? That's it. Teddy Jam for me. Looks like cheese fuzz. That's it. Look at that. Yeah. Perfect well, little slider. Year, right? You know what's nice when people come over yeah. for the holidays? You don't want a full burger. Yeah. We're featuring full burgers at Cape Ponds, but during the holidays, it's nice. Chef, we're going to pick one. Just a little Scooby soon. snack. I two pickles. Two pickles. Two pickles. Well done, yeah. Chef. A little it's two so pickles. It's Look so at that. crunchy and delicious. Do you have any specialty? Of course, well, I got to tell you. So good? We're a little short on line cooks at Cape Ponds at the Found Blue. <laughs> don't say it. I'm just telling you. Friday, Saturday nights. I've got I've got room for a few more. Oh, you know what? We forgot a little fried onions. Forget. Little fried onions on that burger mm. doesn't hurt either. Guys, if you're there, the restaurant in Las Vegas, check it out. It opens up next Wednesday, Fountain Blue. Go to Capon's Burgers, Shakes, Fries. Yum. Too bad we didn't have the fries. Next time we'll make the fries. Next time. Today, Come to the Fountain Blue for the fries. It comes to high. Food. We're back with the third and fourth hours after your local news and weather. Way to go. Happy Chef. holidays, everybody. Way to go, Chef. We did it again, I tell you. Seriously, I'm putting this guy to work. Let me do it. Let me do it. Listen, I want to concentrate. It's easy to overcook these. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. This morning on the third hour of today, Taylor's time.
Taylor Swift and her fans reacting to her being named Time's Person of the Year as the superstar opens up about her life. Her relationship with NFL star Travis Kelsey. And rigorous training for her record-breaking heiress tour. Then later, Yellowstone trouble brewing? We're breaking down a legal battle over coffee between the creator of the hit show and one of its stars. Plus, Tony Shalhoub, live in Studio 1A. I couldn't have done it alone. <laughs> well, maybe I could have, but it would have taken a lot longer. Telling us all about the return of everybody's favorite detective, it's a Monk movie. And in Shop All Day, fashion, tech, Toys and deals. We're giving the gift of holiday savings today, Thursday, December 7th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. And a good Thursday morning. Welcome to this third hour of today. Craig, Chanel, Mr. Roker. Good morning. Uh, Dylan is off this morning. She'll be back tomorrow. Uh, by the way, we have a treat to start the show this oh, morning. What's that? I've been up all night preparing these latkes oh, for thank you. thank you, Craig. Why do I not believe it? What's your, how do you do it? What's your recipe? I take uh, potatoes uh -huh. and I peel them <laughs> and then I shred them and sure. then I fry them. Okay, thank and you. And then I ask Katie in the kitchen to help me. <laughs> exactly. uh, and why do we have the latkes, Craig? Uh, happy Hanukkah. The Festival of Lights starts tonight. So to all of you who celebrate happy happy, happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Tea. These are fantastic. Crunchy. Lockers, Delicious. Yesterday okay. we had a little bit of a spin. We mm -hmm. had these, what was it? Like sweet the, potato. Purple sweet, sweet potato, potato. lockers. But these are more traditional. More traditional. So mm -hmm. happy Hanukkah to are all you, of you. Are you an applesauce latke guy or are you a sour, sour cream? cream? Yes, so do I. Me too. All right. Well, they didn't even give us applesauce. Maybe they just know us so go. well. Now to the story everybody yeah. has been buzzing about. In case you missed it, yesterday we exclusively revealed that Taylor Swift is the Time Person of the Year. And the pop star gave a revealing interview. That's what people are talking about today. NBC's Emily Aketa is here live with that. Good morning to you. Yeah, good morning to you guys. We know Taylor Swift. She rarely does interviews. So us Swifties, we were glued to every word. She talked about her life, career, relationship, and why she is the proudest and happiest she's ever felt. It's a moment in time that has Swifties shrieking with excitement. It's a great day to be a Swiftie. And Taylor Swift sharing the biggest, loudest, most aggressively overexcited thank you on social media after being named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. An honor revealed right here on Today with Savannah and Hoda. We picked a choice, someone who represents joy someone who's bringing light to the world. Time's cover story, Swift's first interview in four years, features a series of stunning photos. The pop star telling the magazine, it feels like the breakthrough moment of my career, happening at 33. And it's one she's trained hard for, describing her rigorous regimen to prepare for the Eras tour. Every day I would run on the treadmill, singing the entire set list out loud, she says. Welcome to the Eras tour. That record-breaking Eras tour, so huge. It boosted local economies and even dominated the silver screen. But since her first album 17 years ago, Swift points out she's been raised up and down the flagpole of public opinion. She discussed some of the most difficult moments, like getting canceled and moving to a foreign country after her public feud with Kanye West and then-wife Kim Kardashian and described feeling beat when her music catalog was sold. But Swift also celebrated some of her biggest influences, like Beyonce, saying she's the most precious gem of a person. Mama is the guy on the trees. As for her love story with Kansas City Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey, Swift says it all started when he put her on blast on his podcast this summer. You made her a bracelet? Yeah, I wanted to give Taylor Swift one with my number on it. Months later, Swift attended multiple Chiefs games while Kelsey traveled all the way to Argentina to support her on tour. We're showing up for each other, Swift tells Time about their relationship. While some are disappointed with the magazine's choice amid a year marred by war, many applauding Time's joyful selection. She absolutely deserves it. She's built an amazing career based solely on her talent. So where does Taylor Swift go from here? Well, fans are hoping she will release Reputation Taylor's version, which she says will have some fire new tracks. So a lot of discussion on that. Okay. okay. When might we see that? Do you know, any ideas? Well, well, there's all sorts of speculation, but Swifties are hoping soon. <laughs> we'll we'll yeah, have like to a birth wait. date or something, or when yeah. she got her oh, driver's license. She's got one coming up. There's, there always, go. there's all of these there's little Easter something. eggs. There's something. always that little, okay. So they go from one Taylor 
to another Taylor in the news. Yellowstone creator Taylor Sheridan has taken legal action against one of the show's stars. But this has nothing to do with the hit series. It's actually over coffee. Huh. NBC entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas here is here to spill the tea about coffee. <laughs> or the coffee, right. We were doing those puns all morning, weren't we? Uh, this lawsuit was filed by Taylor Sheridan's Ranch, and it comes after a rocky year for his hit show Yellowstone, as there's another possible legal battle brewing with star Kevin Costner do what's best for the ranch. A legal battle percolating between the creator of the hit show Yellowstone and one of its own actors. Everybody ready? The lawsuit was filed in a Texas federal court by Bosque Ranch, which is owned by Yellowstone showrunner Taylor Sheridan and serves as a filming location for the series. According to a Wall Street Journal report citing executives and crew members, Yellowstone's network Paramount pays Sheridan up to $50,000 a week to film on his properties. Boss Ranch debuted a coffee line in June and is accusing a coffee company launched four months later by Cole Hauser, who plays ranch hand Rip Wheeler on Yellowstone, of trademark infringement and false advertising. You leave now or you never leave. The grounds for the lawsuit? Boss Ranch alleges that the interlocking letter design of Hauser's Free Rain logo is confusingly similar to the ranch's, causing irreparable damage to its brand. Taylor Sheridan and Boss Ranch did not respond to NBC News' request for comment. Free Rain declined to comment to NBC News on the lawsuit. But Hauser talked about his new brand of coffee on Today when it launched in October. What's the story behind, behind Free Rain? I'll tell you, it's, oh. you know, it's about taking risk. Hmm. You know, it's about enjoying your time and a little bit of coffee. Brand isn't something you earn, it's something you live up to. It could mean even more drama behind the scenes of the wildly popular hit show. Set to start filming its final episodes in the spring after a hiatus during the Hollywood strikes, scheduled to air in November 2024. But there's been no shortage of rumblings surrounding the series' end including whether its star Kevin Costner will appear as John Dutton in the final episodes at all. After Costner testified during a September child support hearing that Paramount, quote, offered him less money than previous seasons and that there were issues with the creatives behind the show. Now it's unclear how the latest legal twist will affect Yellowstone's final days of filming. Costner said during the hearing that he was owed $12 million from the show and that they'd probably go to court over it, meaning another Yellowstone star could be embroiled in a legal dispute soon. And so, you know, for fans of the show that are waiting for the second half of the final mm. season five, because remember, it's the end of the show. Yeah, we don't yeah. know if Kevin Costner is going to be in those final episodes. Everyone's wondering, will this affect whether Cole Hauser, his potential episodes, okay. and how this is all going to play out? So a lot of drama around the show. The side fans, plot messes with the real plot. Exactly. And over some coffee over coffee that's right hopefully they can figure it out a lot of roasting okay. going on uh, but um, well, i was wondering how you were going to work something in <laughs> been working on all morning all he's been workshopping it around the city <laughs> that's right Chloe Chloe and I thank you. tried it out in the makeup room. percolating growing like, oh, be in addition to being the prince of puns and a fantastic cook our buddy mr roker um he's he's a cook so he's let us sit on a shopping okay. list okay so here's the thing al is in the latest issue of AARP magazine. Doesn't get sexier than that. Shut <laughs> up. And he's revealing what's in his shopping cart. What are you doing what on say that you, bar Mr. Top Roker? Right? Well, I'm, in, I'm at uh, the Hudson Farmer's Market, uh, which is one of our favorite places uh, in Hudson, New York. Okay. And so they wanted to follow me around to find out. There are different people in the in the magazine what you go shopping for. And we usually go on Saturdays to the Hudson Farmer's Market okay. and uh, got a lot of fresh food. You get a lot of great, great fish and seafood. And, uh, so I just love going there. He single-handedly is keeping that farmer's market in business, <laughs> like, too. And they're happy today. Oh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a happening place. Yeah? It is. So then do you give us recipes for the herbs and stuff that you buy? Or? No, I don't do that. No. No, just let us enjoy just enjoy just let you show up. Okay. You, by the way, you can grab the newest AARP, regardless of your age. <laughs> just don't come across my lawn! <laughs> it's on newsstands now. Well, thank you for sharing your shopping list with Anytime. us. Anytime. Maybe next episode. Or next episode. <laughs> next issue, we'll get some, some recipes. recipes. All right, well, when we come back, it's today's checklist. This is an important one, how to boost your brain health. And do we all really need eight hours of sleep? And uh -oh. then later, look who's here. Yes. Yeah. Alicia Lynn is live in Studio 1A to tell us about bringing back a crime-solving fan favorite, the return of Monk. We'll be right back.
Yes. This morning on today's checklist, we are talking about ways to keep our brains healthy, from how much sleep we really need to why picking up the phone can actually make a difference. Dr. Guy, excuse me, I just almost, we just said that, Guy Tree Devi uh, is a clinical professor of neurology and psychiatry at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Good morning to you. Good morning. So let's start with this, <clears throat> let's talk about sleep. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I only need four or five hours and I'm good. Is it true that for all ages and different people, it, it, it does vary? Or do we need that solid eight to 10 hours? It really depends on the person. So it does vary. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no one size fits all for sleep. <laughs> and um, so you can, you can get away with four or five hours. You need eight hours. Some people need 10, 11 hours. So there's, and some people stress about not sleeping enough. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So really you have to realize that people need different I didn't realize Lots you were going to say that. I thought for yeah. sure you would say eight hours for everybody. Or no. Seven Is it no. true as you and get older? And actually it changes. As, as you, you get, get older, older, you need less sleep. Yeah. Babies need a lot of sleep. And the benefits of it? Well, sleep does three very important things. It cleans up. When you sleep, your brain's sanitation system is so much more efficient. Mm. Gets rid of all the toxic stuff like plaques, which are associated with things like Alzheimer's disease and other toxic substances. Sleep's also good for... Uh, memory, so memories from the day, it gets consolidated and puts into the structure of the brain. And then thirdly, sleep's really good for reducing stress and anxiety. So you can't beat sleep. Yeah. No. Yeah. Let's talk about diet and nutrition, especially this time of year. A lot of folks find themselves at parties and get togethers, yeah. eating a bunch of garbage. Um, but how do we make sure that we're eating right? And how does that boost our brains? Well, two important things. You want to cut down on carbs and glucose and high levels of any kind of sugar. So you want to try to reduce all the refined carbohydrates like rice and pasta and croissants and all the things we really love. Mm -hmm. What does that do? Uh, well, it increases, it spikes your glucose levels and that increases insulin resistance, which is not good for your brain. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, if you want to eat fruits, try to eat more the actual fruit rather than the juices. Mm. Um, and also- The pulp. The pulp, the Got pulp it. and the skin and all of that. And also try to eat the color palette. Try to eat lots of leafy green vegetables. Try to eat something that's all the colors. Mm -hmm. Imagine you're eating like a nice colorful painting. Like a rainbow. Oh, right. yeah. Eat a rainbow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eat the rainbow. Colorful yeah. plate. Well, what about exercise? How important is that? Exercise is very, very important. Important for a couple of reasons. One is exercise gives you a very healthy heart. And the healthier your heart, the better it is for your brain. Because even though your brain weighs such a small amount compared to the rest of your body, the brain actually uses up a quarter to up to a quarter of all the energy and all the cardiac mm. output from your heart. So your brain's highly energy intensive. Also, exercise improves your brain functioning, mm -hmm. your cognitive, your memory, your executive function, mm -hmm. it's really good. And you don't have to do like a massive workout, you say there's certain yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, you can, I think, you know, there, there are those of us who love exercise, but if you can't do that much exercise, just do a few squats a day, mm -hmm. a few times when you're watching TV, get up and do a few squats, huh. bare squats, go out for a couple of walks, mm. blocks around, the, yeah. Physical exercise is important, but mental exercise is important as well. My grandmother, hi, Grandma Ma, I know she's watching. For, since I've been born, crossword puzzles, all of the things, do those really make a difference over the years? Yes, I think that, but you know, for example, I hate Sudoku. Yeah. And there are people who say, oh my <laughs> God. by it. Yeah, you know, you gotta do this, you yeah. gotta do, just do something that brings you joy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you are somebody who's at a desk all day, go out and do gardening. If you are somebody who likes to do a lot of work related to computers, um, then do something completely different. So it's what not it, about puzzles and crossword puzzles? It's not. It's just about activating different areas of your mm. brain. So your whole brain stays robust. And the more areas of your brain that you keep healthy, mm. the better your brain's going to do it's over It's like a time. mental palette. Mm. It is. Exactly. It's a rainbow palette in the brain. Really quickly, we, when, you know, during the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about the importance of social connections. Yeah. I, 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 talk a little bit about the benefits of, of that with regard to boosting our brain. Well... I think we are social animals. Yeah. We need other people. Our brain's built that way. Our brain's really not built to connect with people via texting and online. Amen. Yeah, so sadly, we really need other people around to help us get along and to help us feel better. Hmm. It's helpful for stress reduction. It's helpful um, to really allow us to thrive. 
So I always say, pick up the phone, yeah. call somebody. Yes. The human voice is really important. And um, it's something that we shouldn't forget to do. So Amen. Holidays and all year round. Dr. Guy Devi, thank you for coming in this morning. Thank you very much. When we come back, look who's back. Monk, back on the case. Tony Shalhoub live here in the studio to tell us about <laughs> stepping back <laughs> into, into one of his most famous roles <laughs> in a brand new movie that's about to hit Peacock. Third hour of today, right back after this. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming to this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage, liberated? We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. We have been looking so forward to talking to our next guest. For five seasons, Tony Shalhoub has starred as Abe Weissman in the hit series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. But prior to that, Tony was widely known as Monk, Adrian Monk, that is, the brilliant former detective that battled OCD, a role which earned him three Emmys for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Comedy Series. Well, now, after almost 15 years, Mr. Monk is back. He's back in a new Peacock film. It's called Mr. Monk's Last Case. He's on a mission to solve one more mystery involving his stepdaughter, and he's reuniting with some familiar faces. Mr. Monk, I assume you take it neat? I'll pass. No, I, I, I cannot tell you what an honor it is to have the great Adrian Monk in my house. You know, when I first moved here in 2002, you were already a legend. For a while there, it seemed that you were solving a major case every week. Thank you, I couldn't have done it alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I could have, but it would have taken a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he had missed a beat. Tony, yeah. good, morning. Good, morning. good morning. Good to have you back. Good to be here. Thank we you. We were talking earlier about, you know, remakes like this and how, uh, how they, reboots can be dangerous because but, sometimes the writers don't come back. Sometimes the actors don't come back. Everyone came back for this one. Yeah, and we're, we're so happy. Everybody, not only did they come back, but they came back with so much enthusiasm. And uh, um, we, we all just realized how much we missed uh, the material, the characters, the, the, the ensemble work. And uh, it was a really good experience. Well, it must be pretty good because it's already been nominated for a Critics' Choice Award. And we haven't even dropped it. Haven't even, that's, that's what, when you haven't even, people haven't seen it and they know it's good. <laughs> so we love it. How, how, was it. Was it hard getting back into the, into the character of Monk? Or you know, it was, it was amazing. It was a little daunting at first. I, uh, I, I, I didn't know exactly, you know, can I, how do you recapture what, the physical life of the character? Has my, has my voice even changed over those 14 years? I don't know. Uh, certainly I look different, as you can see. But, um, but uh, I guess by like the end of the first day, we were 
being so good. We just kind of got, fell right into the groove and we were doing it. I mean, the title of the movie is Mr. Monk's Last Case. Yeah. Is it really the last? <laughs> oh. <laughs> you have to ask term? the writer and the, and the network <laughs> about that. I, um, I, I wouldn't, I don't like to ever close the door completely. Let's just leave it ajar. So just, right. just a little crack in there. Yeah, like we'll that. take it. Um, you know, Al loves the, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I was a big fan as well. Thanks. Um, congratulations on a heck of a run there. Oh, Five really? seasons just wrapped up. I, I heard that you guys have this group chat. <laughs> oh, right. right. We we uh, we do. We text each other a lot. And and uh, actually, I'm going to see them all tonight. Oh. Uh, later uh, this evening, we're doing a, a Screen Actors Guild screening and panel for the last season. Which was yeah. perfect. And uh, the, it, we were so proud of the way uh, it ended up. Yeah. That was that. so terrific. And speaking of, you know, I, I didn't realize this, but it turns out there's a lot of buzz online that says you auditioned before you did Monk, you auditioned for the role of, of Kramer in Seinfeld. And you said, this what? is not true. No, that is not true. Oh. I, I auditioned for George Costanz for the role of George. Whoa, really? I didn't yes. know that. Yes. Whatever, I wonder whatever happened. Did I get that? No, <laughs> you did not. I, oh, okay. You did. That is I just, so I, It was so long ago. So what was that? What, yeah. what, what, what happened? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what happened. Jason Alexander. I know, I know. I can't tell you how many roles I've lost to Jason Alexander. Really? <laughs> Let's not go down That's that. And yet you end up acting with him, across from him, in, in Mrs. Maisel. And he actually did an episode of Monk with us, too. Oh, that's He's awesome. just a delight. I wonder what that's like as an actor, and I'll never know. When you, you know, you were going to do a role, but you didn't for whatever reason, and then you see that person. You know, what does Ooh. that, what does that feel like? Well, it uh, depends on how good or bad the okay, material fair. turns out to be. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're now um, a grandfather of two. Uh, they are three and nine months old, right? Correct, yeah. What do they call you? Uh, they call me Noni. What's oh. Noni? Uh, well, Noni, uh, I, when I uh, first met my wife, Brooke Adams, uh, who also, by, way, but, by the way, appears in the Monk movie, oh. and... Um, uh, she had adopted, as a single woman, uh, had adopted a daughter, and um, we were doing a play together, and Josie uh, called me Noni, because she couldn't say Tony, and so that name oh. Oh. And so now my uh, grandson calls me. Oh, that's Noni. sweet. That's sweet. Noni, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you sure. for being here, Noni Shalhoub. Thank you. Um, Tony, always thank a you. pleasure. Oh, always a pleasure. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Congratulations on being a grandfather. Mr. Monk's last case, a Monk movie, it premieres tomorrow on Peacock. Right. Or is it the last? <laughs> no, it's true. That's right. Well, still to come, we've got an exclusive look inside a new state-of-the-art facility, how all this high-tech equipment could help keep us safe when extreme weather hits. Then later in Shop All Day, your totes going to love these picks. <laughs> Gifts for everyone on your list, all with exclusive deals as well. Third hour today, right back. We're going to tote. Totes. Back with our series today, Climate. In 2023, 
is going to go down as the hottest year on record. That's according to the European Union's Climate Change Service. In fact, just this week, we've seen wild weather in the Pacific Northwest with torrential rain and historic flooding. And this increase in intensive weather events has created an urgent need for new solutions to help keep us all safe. Here in New York State, there's now a first-of-its-kind weather and climate emergency alert network, and we got an exclusive look inside. It's become our new normal, experiencing extreme weather from coast to coast. Just how many billion dollar weather and climate related disasters have hit the U.S. this year? According to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that number reaching 25 versus the annual average of eight. This rapid increase in these events has officials at every level of government working quickly to try to adapt plans and policies to keep the public safe. In New York, a state threatened by nearly every type of natural disaster, from hurricanes to blizzards to wildfire smoke, a first-of-its-kind State Weather Risk Communication Center, or SWRCC, just launched. Governor Kathy Hochul gave us an exclusive look. So, Governor, what, what is this room? Where are we? This is the Mesonet room. We're taking data from the National Weather Service. There are great partners in mm -hmm. this. Adding the data we're collecting from these points that are every 19 miles throughout the state. So we have data on the ground. The Mesonet network collects and reports real-time weather conditions from 126 sites 24 hours a day. This data used both in major weather events and collected as historical record. As opposed to a forecast, this helps you deal with what is happening on the ground at any given moment throughout the state. We always will want the forecast from you, but what's happening after that forecast become a reality, the conditions can change quickly, and people need to know what's happening in their neighborhood. That's how we can really manage the best we can what Mother Nature is doing right now. Meteorologist Dr. Nick Bazil is director of the SWRCC. When there's an extreme weather event, what, what's happening at the center? Yeah, so our employees will be monitoring as much weather data as they can. And what we want to do is collate, synthesize that data, share it with partners in state government mm -hmm. as easily readable as formats as possible so they can react to it without needing a meteorology degree. Still in its early stages, the center was put to the test during New York City's heavy rainfall and flash flooding event in September. We were able to start implementing our, our first tools, which were a, a real-time sewer capacity exceedance map. So basically, are we seeing more rain than the sewers can handle in real time? And sure enough, those pinpointed Brooklyn as areas that were likely to be hardest hit, and that's where we saw the most impacts, unfortunately. This system allowed us to communicate immediately to our partners so that they can better know, okay, we better start sending assets to Brooklyn, to Western Queens, to Eastern Manhattan right now. And that's the goal, a coordinated effort in the sharing of real-time information. If you look at that globe, a lot of things happen that are outside of New York State's borders. How do you think perhaps other governors will be looking at this system? These systems don't know geographic boundaries. They just sweep across our country. And to the extent that we can prepare a model for other governors to adopt, and implement, then we're all going to be safer. That's what we have a responsibility to do. That's how we protect lives. And in fact, we have an exclusive announcement. State Weather Risk Communication Center officially opens today oh. at the University of Albany. Not a moment too soon. If this year's weather extremes are just a preview, they are going to be very, very busy mm -hmm. in the next next few years to come. Uh, but it, it, I think other states are going to start adopting this because the more data you have sure. uh, real time, you can do better forecasting, but also better real time work, whether it's rain, snow, hurricanes, you can uh, get your resources where you need to as quickly That's as you can. That's the takeaway. Yeah. All right. It's a good deal. Thanks, Thank so. you. Thanks, guys. All right. When we come back, we are going to raise a glass and shop all day. Exclusive deals on home goods, fashion, and more for everyone in your family when we come right back. And then later this year, bows aren't just for gifts. <laughs> Celebrity hairstylist Chris Appleton is here to show us some fun holiday looks for every type of occasion. We love it when he comes. We'll be right back.
are back. We're back with Shop All Day. And if you're still searching for that perfect gift, fear not. We've got you covered. It's a good thing that you waited, perhaps, because we have an exclusive deal on every single one of these products just for our today viewers. And to share more information, today editorial director Adriana Brock herself scanned that QR code to see all of these picks. But before we dig into the products, this, this browser extension, it's, it's the sweeping thing. the nation. Yeah. It's sweeping the nation. It's sweepingtoday.com. It's called Shop Today Savings. And I think we have a little video of how it works. Okay. It's basically an internet coupon finder. It's a browser extension. You download it to your Chrome browser. You pin it. It's so easy to use. It finds all the deals and discounts for you while you're shopping online at over 40,000 stores. Does it let wow. you know or do you have to start buying it and then it tells you it that it lets you, you get... know it once you get to your checkout you go online you shop at any store online if it, if there's coupons it will it find will them find for them you. On when you how do it know? It do it know. It it. And because of the holiday season and shop today's got you covered on everything we've got 50 <laughs> exclusive deals that you can only get through that extension. So if you scan the QR code oh. get on it okay. get your holiday shopping and save with is us. I like these. This is one of them. This yeah. is from Spanx. So Chanel, you know Spanx this makes is from clothes. Spanx? Yes, they make clothes, um, not just undergarments. And feel how soft this is. I this is this. one of my personal is favorites. It's a pullover, 15% off for this Air Essentials <laughs> feel hoodie. It. Feel how soft it is. Your face. Because this like, is a win. Oh, that is soft. Jill Martin That's would call soft. this a triumph. Look at how yes. stretchy it is. It's so stretchy. It's got four-way stretch. And you can't really tell because the mannequins are nicely uh, put Quaff, together uh, here. Yeah. But they're, it's kind of long, and it's called Got You Covered because uh. it's long enough to cover your See, back they, and the front. See, that's the thing about Spanx. They, they know. Like, they forget know. thigh gap. Just cover it down a Exactly. Bit. You cover it up. You could wear it with your leggings. <laughs> Wow. Wear it with jeans. Never thought we'd hear yeah. the, the phrase know. thigh gap. Okay. Well, no, no. I don't I think do. that's appropriate for today. Oh, no, sure it's, it is. It's not What's next? It is today. You can use this to cover your thigh gap. No. Okay, <laughs> guys, you cannot. But can I tell you about the state bag? Yes. This is one of the hottest bags right now, and they rarely go on sale. And we have a discount for you guys 30% off their tote bag, which is so roomy. If you open it up, I this is this. one of those tote bags, Chanel, that you know you look can Look at fit. all the bubble wrap you I can mean, put there's in a there. Ton of bubble. <laughs> yeah, that's to keep it puffy. Stop to that. Don't look puffy. in there. But yeah, you can put a laptop in here, a pair of shoes, your water bottle, Small a change of child. clothes. <laughs> no, no children, but it's great for travel because it also has a trolley strap in the back. Yeah. Oh. So this is oh, a I love the this trolley is, strap. This is yeah. Yeah, that's yes, this is a really nice What's brand. What's the, um, is there a deal on this yes, one? Yes, 30% off. Everything's got a deal. Everything's got a deal. Full disclosure, I have about three of these really? Are they I the ones that Zach wears? Yeah, yes. Zach wears them. Yes, stage Zach. manager. Because so, you can take them out like that. The fact he wears this color. Yes. <laughs> Allbirds is, oh, is a great brand. He's not wearing them today. He's not wearing them today. But Allbirds is a great brand. I know, uh, Craig, you love it. My husband loves these. All the guys that are watching today love these too. So we got a deal on the wool slip on, which is super comfy, cozy, for men and women? lightweight. For men and women on okay. the website, but these okay. are our, one of our favorites. Okay. Brings the price 35% off, oh, under wow. $70. That's a deal. Yeah, this is a great one for the guy who's so hard to shop for. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I love these. Okay. So colored glassware yes. is all the rage right now, and there's all these brands that make them. They're so expensive. Mm -hmm. This set is originally $60. Yes. It's on sale for $29.99, and with Ooh. our exclusive discount of 30% off, it brings it down to $21. Okay. And this is a great gift for the host in your life. Mm -hmm. One of our editors, Audrey, found these, and she's obsessed with them. She says it's such a good way when you're hosting to give everybody a different color. It's pretty. And they know which one's theirs. That's a great idea. That's yeah. a good idea. Yes, party okay. hosting hack. What is this? And last but not least, this is our tech find. This turns your iPhone, a 6 or newer, into yeah. a gaming console on the go. Oh, cool. So this is great for the gamer in your life, the kids who oh, love their video games. It. You put your phone in it, and you nowadays you could get all your uh, video games through cloud. So Xbox One, Amazon has one, um, oh. Apple Arcade, all of those, PlayStation. You hook it up, and then you've got your gaming console right there on the go when you're traveling that's, anywhere. That's and a, that could be a great gift that's for you. That's a real, I was yeah. just about yeah. to say, this yeah. is a good one. How this much is, is this one? one? This one's on sale. It's 30% off. Nice. So, cool. yeah. Really These were ride. great. Hey, John, yeah. thank you. And is there still time for the holidays? For, yes, for, for shipping. Get yes. them now. Yes, okay. yes. And to get them now, you can scan that QR code. That's where you get all the deals. And don't forget, we have more than 50 more exclusive deals if you download that extension at today.com slash savings. All right. Thank you, as always. Yes, thank all you. All right. Coming up next, celebrity hairstylist Chris Appleton is here to show us some hot party looks, including one he calls... The Holiday Bombshell. We're going to show you how to do it. Boom. Well, he'll show you how to do it when we come right back. Gorgeous. Gorgeous.
All right, it is holiday party season, and this morning we have a treat for you. We are going to add some festive fun to your look with help from celebrity hairstylist Chris Appleton, who is coming, by the way, here right from the red carpet at the 2023 Fashion Awards. You were just in London. Absolutely, it was the best time. But do you know what? It was actually chucking it down with rain on that. Really? I don't know why. Yeah, it's England. It, it just well, you rains. You said that, and I'm like, but you don't even see the rain there. I know, true. But yeah. it was raining aggressively. But so much fun. So but much good to fun. be back in New York. So you know what you're doing here. You are a pro. And so here's the thing, Absolutely. guys. We're getting a treat here. Um, so the first thing of the look, I didn't realize, are bows back for adults season. for grown women? It's been, honestly, I think viral on TikTok. Mm. These bows have been going everywhere. Now, okay. this is the most extreme. This is actually a look we saw at one of the fashion shows. Okay. Where they basically dressed all the hair in these really tiny, inexpensive bows. But bows come in all different colors and sizes. And even like Nicole Kidman, for example, last met Bull. I saw that. She just had her hair straight and had a big bow in the back. It was really subtle. So bows are your interpretation. Well, I was going to ask you, so what's the key to make it like she and not look like your four-year-old. I think have fun with it. Have fun with it and play with it. Make it inexpensive. For example, like your hair. So yes. you've got your hair up, turn around from that. Yes. Let's see it from the back. Give it and from the back. Put a little bow there. Like you know I what I mean? You could have like a little there. bow there. That'd be cute. Look, that you see, it's a little cute. festive cheer. So Adds a little bit. Slip them along here. So easy. Okay. Inexpensive as well. You can literally can you guys listen, see this? guys. It's you Christmas. See that? You guys should be getting gifts. You should be getting bows everywhere. So I you can have that. fun with it. I think mean, obviously this is a really fun way of jazzing it up. Okay. And if you really want to make a statement, you can. Because then from the front, it's a little bit more business. Oh yeah. It's a party in the back, but at the front, she's a little bit more it's a 2023 a bit more mullet exactly, yes exactly. <laughs> i love it all right what's our next look so have fun the next look is all this about is girl bombshell yes and she is bombshelling it today um listen glam hair never goes out of fashion not for at the all. hollywood period mm. i think and can you believe this is a natural color how, how beautiful do you is, this color? is it really i know I just, I, I, everyone's said that like a hundred times but so for chris for the for, for the ladies at home yes is it the overcorrected part like how do you get that va va voom look the key to the hollywood look is basically going for that deep side part Side so part. obviously um, we had a natural texture. We stretched it out a little bit. We used the flex styler just to create some voluminous curls. Again, these What's are all over do? TikToks. Basically, you just suck the hair in like this. It's kind of like a modern curling iron. Wait, I've never seen it in action. I've seen oh, it on really? Instagram. Yeah, you've no. seen it everywhere. I'm Every, worried everyone's it's seen suck it. Your hair in. No, it sucks the ends up, and you do this, and it gives you like a blow-dried bombshell kind of vibe. Because it gives it body. Absolutely. So it, it gives you body, and it kind of just sucks it in. I mean, you must have seen this all I've over. I've seen them. I just but it gives never you like these nice action. bouncy gorgeous. curls. Gorgeous. And then if you really want to jazz it up. It wouldn't be the party season. You might want to step away. Okay. Because everyone knows do? glitter stays around. Are you, are you about to put you glitter in You might as well just here? set your house well, on. I'm already a unicorn, Chris. So I don't this, is, this is kind of like a nice little gold glitter spray. So if you oh, want to jazz yeah. it up for the holiday period, you can I find can one in your sweater. color. And honestly, this was I think this was $5. It's from a party store. But it gives it a really oh, nice little, gold love. kind of little shimmer. A and a nice idea. little sparkle. I'm going to need you to wear a, as well. uh, what do you call it, cape first while he's spraying that. That looks beautiful. Well. Looks hot. I'm going to copy that look. You might see it tomorrow. And also, you know what? There's even these. I was going to show you this as well. What this is, is actually like a gel and it has glitter in it. Ooh. So even you can jazz it up in that kind but of way as well. where do you put well. it? Like just... So you could put it in your part, which leads me on Ooh. to the next model. Let's Madame, show you Madame. The you next may be sleepy, look. but you're on I it. I know, I was on it. I'm like really... No, you're like, good. I'm, you're I'm good. feeling it. I'm okay, excited what are we for the period. Okay. Look at this. Look, this is for all you short haired girls. I feel like all the time people say to me, Short hair, yep. what do we do with it? Yep. How do we jazz up short hair for the holiday period? What so do you this do? is a natural way. <gasps> Look at oh, that part. Oh, you jewels in the part. So this is just this really cute, like they're really, again, inexpensive yeah, from a craft store. Yeah, I put them on my cell phone back in the day. Do you you got it. And then everyone says, how do we make them stick? So I, look how amazing. If I saw someone like that at a party, I'd be like, wow, she's What did style. you do? How did you do it? So all you need to do, everyone's got a bit of eyelash glue at home. Yeah. Eyelash glue on the end of that. I use a tweezer. Just a tweezer for application. You just pop them in the pot. You it don't literally have eyelash, but you can get it anywhere, any pharmacy, yeah, it, anything. It, it literally and it took comes five minutes. So but it's a great way to jazz it up. Or if not, if you really wanted to have fun, okay. I would probably do something here Let where you see. can paint the um, silver into the pot, Ooh. you know? And you can paint this pot, you can paint it in and just paint yeah. it down the pot. And that's literally just gel and glitter. You can make it yourself. I love that. You don't even need to spend money. So they're just a few fun ways that. to what spice it up for Christmas. Where would you oh, put a nice those? little spice. I like those. Uh, okay, Just well, a little sparkle. In the back. Why are you come always on. coming for me, Chris? Come on, let's I feel like you're always... Okay, okay fine. Easy. Let's take the bows I'm going, babe. The bows pinned. out. The bows out. Okay. And just a little slight... Yeah, all right, he, guys. Chris a little sparkle in the like back. A little sparkle in the back. He can't help it. Like, every time he comes, I'm just flipping things on. to do my hair. Clipping it on everywhere. But the key is to have fun with it this Can I tell you something? Yeah. Every time you leave us, and then I go on social media, and you're with Kim Kardashian, or you're on the red carpet over here, and I'm like, we are so lucky to have you because you're very good at what Aww, you do. Oh, you're very sweet. So happy holidays. You too. Me too. Get guys, have rest. fun this season. Yes. And spice and you, it up. And you know what? These are all doable styles. Absolutely. Like, these are things that we can all do. Inexpensive and fun. We love it. That's Thank what it's you, all about. Chris.
Craig, Al, you can come out of hiding now, wherever you are. We'll be right back. I'm going to get them with the glitter. Exactly. Where are they? I'm going to get them. Let's get the glitter. Let's get them some oh. sparkles. Tomorrow on the third hour today, look who we have. Ooh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have, um, <laughs> you may remember him from Downton Abbey and The Crown. Actor Matthew Good will be live in studio. You had to wait eight. till the prompter came closer <laughs> so you could read. I don't know what you're talking about. Coming up wait. on Hoda and Jenna, Saturday Night Live's Chloe Fine. You couldn't even read it from there. Well, you Get your me. eyes checked. You don't know me. We'll see you tomorrow. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Get back. Here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. Today, get ready to laugh with Saturday Night Live star Chloe Feynman. Plus, relationship expert Nedra Glover Tawab helps you set healthy boundaries for the holidays. And we're talking about Hollywood A listers Halle Berry and Angelina Jolie. What Halle says the two bonded over after their friendship got off to a rocky start. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, so up, it's today right with Hoda. And Jenna. It all starts right now. It's a hey, hey, hey. Welcome, everybody. It's Thursday. It's December the 7th. We're so happy to see you. Thank you again for yesterday. Oh, We're, yes. We, we still are kind of basking in the afterglow. Yeah, because we... We got to be stars for just one day. For a fleeting moment. Anyway, we want to say thank you guys yes. for uh, for going on the ride. Um, how are you? How's ever? What are you looking at? This? I'm looking at your Amazon color, okay. which I love. Okay. By the way, they sell these on Amazon. Wait, this is a it's, great gift. It's not a real shirt. Do you know the kind? Yeah, we do. It's you a know bib. The, it's like a it's, it's like a, a bib. bib. Yeah. Anyway, they sell them, and you can put them on your sweaters. Now, why are you snoring no, at just, it? No, I just because I like it's it. It's on Amazon. I think it's a great gift. I wore one yesterday too. I know. How many of these glitters <laughs> do you have? have? Four. And you'll you'll know by next week exactly. Because you're going to wear it. I love. I, I've decided that I'm into cozy sweaters right now. With a little winter. pop. A <laughs> no, I'm into it. Do you know that there was a period of time when I was in fourth grade where I was into wearing ties? What do you mean, like men's ties? Men's ties. <laughs> Just because? Because they were popular from the limited two back in oh, 19. Oh, the limited. Remember, remember limited? Do you remember casual corner? Oh, I loved casual corner. Casual corner. But limited and two the was, limited was two. us. Cool. Two, T O O. T O O. But, so there was a period, and then the nerdiest part of the whole scenario yeah. is that we would make ties for our cats to wear to match us. Oh, um, I have a question for you, speaking of cats. Yes. Taylor Swift posed with Benjamin Button. Oh, yeah. 
And you claimed I, that you were going to pose with Hollywood Hager. I'm still going to. I want to see it because I'm noticing a trend on... That other people are doing people it? People are putting their cats around, around their, their necks, necks. And some of the cats are freaking out no, and no, jumping up. No, no, my cat is the most lovely... Wonderful. On Monday, on Monday, okay. Could you please come in with your picture? Yes, and kind of a la Taylor. I well, what I need is I need that leotard. By the way, if you have not read the Taylor oh, Swift wow. article, wow. Sam Lasky, who's an incredible yeah. writer, wrote it, mm -hmm. and he's it, also a Swifty. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you know, like he, he connected, knows, he but he's also her. a great writer. Great writer. And all I have to say is that article. Will, will what jumped out at you? I, the amount of work yeah that she goes in that she and not that that's a surprise but what she did to prepare for her like running on the treadmill oh and gosh. singing she she sang her set all of her sets while running on the treadmill imagine that yes for one second. i also i i felt like it was a real it shed a real light onto the fact that all she's doing right now is living mm -hmm. and not being afraid. That's interesting. Because people are like, why is your relationship so public? Yeah. And, and her response is, I'm going to dinner. With my boyfriend. That's what every other normal person does. And instead of like being worried about the what other people think, she's just like, she's in it. She's, yeah, she's going to dinner. She's doing what couples do. Yes. Like, why are they living so publicly? It's like, because they want to go out and eat. Because she wants to support him at his yeah. games. Yeah. I liked when she said, the dads, chads, and brads. That was hilarious. <laughs> anyway, read this article yeah, yeah. and then have your children read it, which is what I'm hoping to do. Oh, there, there it is, the cat picture. Oh, yeah. Okay, so remember. I wish I had her here right now because. Hollywood? I'm, well, yeah, I would mm -hmm. do it live. Okay, well, I think on Monday we need to see it because she brought that cat with her. Because I asked the Time Magazine. Well, should I editor, bring Hollywood in? I don't. Well, you have to well, see. Don't you love how Gavin is just. You know, Gavin. What do we love about you, Gavin? Is you're a yes dude. Yeah, you just say yes. We like it. Okay. All right. Halle, Halle Berry. Berry. Yeah, she <laughs> sat down with Variety to talk about her next project. And this project is a new uh, action comedy movie. It's called Maud versus Maud. And the co-star is Angelina Jolie. Okay, I love the idea of these mm -hmm. two women pairing mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So she admitted that she and Angelina got off to a rocky start in their relationship, but they eventually connected over many things they have in common saying, we've been talking a lot about divorces and exes, and we've bonded. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, that's interesting because sometimes when you meet someone who, I don't know if they're a lot alike, it's hard to tell, but if, you, if someone is a lot alike, I wonder if you kind of either back away. Like, I feel like when I meet a new yeah, friend, friend, I feel like I know right away. Yes. Like, I feel like there's a connect right away, yeah. and if I feel like I can have a deep conversation quickly, then I know that's my kind of person. Yeah. yeah. If I feel like I can, the person's like, oh, I don't know, then I, I don't feel like we are connected. It's so interesting about first impressions, yeah. too, because you never, like, I have friends that will say, oh, my gosh, that friend of yours, she was kind of mean. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Yeah. How? That friend that is the warmest the friend I know. Awesome, right. And and then and I think the more self-aware you are, the person's like, oh, yeah, no, people say that about me. Yeah. I know. Right. But it's like when you loved somebody for so long, you don't see that side of right. them. Right. I don't really know what to say. <laughs> no, no. But I think your point is, is that sometimes you're... <laughs> Stop. Please stop. Okay. This is what sometimes happens. And I don't <laughs> even know what it is. This was supposed to be a deep Okay, combo. let's move on. Mariah Carey likes to take baths. She does. <laughs> and, I, and you know what? We have to say to Mariah, we are sorry about page six that called us the new queens of Christmas because we didn't call ourselves that. It was page six. We they didn't did quote it. ourselves that. You we were didn't. still the queen. And we didn't plant it. We didn't have anyone place it. She's the queen and where we're her the, duchess is. Right. Okay. We're her ladies in waiting. Okay. And we're going to be waiting. By the you know, way, until Mar next Christmas. Mariah is, 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 by the way, is featured on People Magazine's digital cover, which is gorgeous. And she opens up not only about being the queen of Christmas, but she loves a bath. And she says while she's in a bath, she's on the phone. She, she has her dog she in there? She brings her dog in the tub. 
What? What's happening well, there? Well, she just yes. has diamonds. It looks like diamonds yeah. and She bubbles. said, everybody gets mad at me when they talk to me and I'm in the bath. They're like, it's a little boomy where you are. What are you doing? Oh, she talks on the phone just yeah. talking away. But I've been like that since I was little, she says. Well, I, you know, remember we used to fight about baths? That was one of the things that really divided us. Me and you? Now we're united. I kind of like a bath now, but occasionally. I, I How like, many a month do you Probably take? two a month, but... I like a bath now on occasion because I like to not be on my feet. And I feel like I spend my most of my time on my feet. You need to be walking, horizontal. But, yeah, just to, to all of a sudden you're like, that's what it <sighs> feels like to have all your weight off of your legs. Have you ever um, put a little Epsom salt up in there? Up in there? <laughs> up in the bathtub? <laughs> have you? No. You've never had an Epsom salt bath? I know what Why I'm giving you for Christmas. Me? Just because that's so what does you. It, do? it makes you de-bloat. It makes oh, you it relax. Does? But actually, um, two nights ago when I got into my bathtub, which yeah. is a place I like to spend a lot <laughs> yeah. of time. Yeah, what happened? I thought of you. Why? Because I was like, oh, I, re I remember Hoda used to hate baths and now she likes them. I do like them. I'm a convert. My thought came, yes. my thought, you're, you in I'm the touched. bathtub came to my mind. <laughs> I'm touched. All right, so Bradley Cooper's got a new role. He is now on the side of food truck chef. So Bradley <laughs> and Angelo's Pizzeria teamed up and they launched these Danny and Coop's Coop. cheese steaks. Because he's a Philly fan, one. you know he is. Yeah. yeah. So yesterday they opened up a pop-up food truck right here in New York City. There's Bradley. He's manning the kitchen. Uh -huh. Look at him. Look, Look at, at him. him with he, that by the way, he works it. You feel like he, he really works it. By the way, his ex, Irina Shayek, and his rumored girlfriend, Gigi Hadid. Yeah, both there. Both came for Look, a cheesesteak. there steak. they go. Cheesesteak time. Do you like a cheesesteak? <laughs> I, uh, you can say, I do like a cheese. I don't really eat that much red meat. And I have to say it took me until college until I tried a cheesesteak. Yeah. And I was astounded by, well, it's just a lot up in that bread roll. <laughs> I mean, right. don't you agree? Yes. And you're dunking it in the juice, you know, the au jus. Do you have to duck it in there? Uh, you. Do you like a, um, I do there. It's heavy. It's a lot, but yeah. it, you got to make sure you got to be you're ready prepared. <laughs> All right. Like, don't be traveling nowhere. We're actually having cheesesteaks delivered according to sources. Wait, what? They, they didn't make it yet? They're, They're delivering the, the cheesesteaks. Is Bradley Cooper bringing them? No. Oh. Okay. Okay. Maybe All right. next time. All right. Look who's <laughs> here, you guys. Chloe Feynman. We love our Chloe. Yeah, Chloe, do you like a cheesesteak? They're a lot. It's They're a lot. lot. Okay, it's a lot. Of impressions, Saturday Night Live's Chloe Feynman's <laughs> going to hang with us. Maybe eating cheesesteaks. Right after this. I don't know about that. I don't. I don't. I don't. Look closely. Really closely, but shall we just say, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow? We got some flurries out here at 30 Rock. Oh, right in front of the tree. Oh, How magical is just this? Just in time for Chloe Fine. Oh, well, we this love working best. in 30 Rock. One of the reasons why is we share this space with the tree, but also with some of the most talented people in show business, including Saturday Night Live's Chloe Fine. Of course, we, have, we know Chloe because of many, many reasons, but our spot on impressions of wow. celebs like Drew uh, Barrymore, Meryl Streep, Gigi Hadid, Timothy Chalamet, all of them. Hi, Chloe. Hi. Did you cue the snow for you? I did. Start? I brought the snow. Well, the best part is you're matching the snow in that suit. Yes, yes. And the couch. Yes, yes. yes. You're so cute. If you laid Thank back you. and remove the red pillow, you could camouflage. I know. I'd kind of do a, so, a lady. So, Chloe, um, this is our decor that we have in 30 Rock. I love you, it. You 
love interior design. I you, do. That's that's your thing. It's something you've loved. I know mm -hmm. Architecture Digest did something on your beautiful uh -huh. apartment, and we have uh -huh. some of your own personal photos. But tell us about <laughs> tell us about tell us about your <laughs> my personal photos. Yes, yes. Um, gosh, I mean, I really think. I don't know. Oh, it's it's so just the pretty. woman in me. Yeah, this is how I procrastinate at work. So, so how do you know what goes with what? Like, what's um, your, gee, well, my sister cool. did both of those paintings. So oh. having free art. Oh, she's an artist. She is an artist. Yes. Um, so I kind of start with the free art and then kind of take it away. She's gorgeous. It's I know, interesting aren't they nice? that both of you all are artists. Was yeah. there? Mm -hmm something your parents did to foster that? Um, I guess they're crazy and like, <laughs> believe that we could be artists. Uh -huh. I love that. Um, yeah, she and I actually made these earrings. <gasps> Wait, what? Yeah, we have a jewelry club. Are you guys we... close? You must we be. are, yeah, she's my best friend. Uh -oh. Okay, and mm -hmm. does she live here? She lives in London, which is torturous. Wait, yeah. why, why'd she just- I don't know. Did I don't you know say, why... why do you hate me so much? <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. But I will say we're like the closest we've ever been probably because we are the farthest apart. Mm. Well, that does now, help. We always talk about manifesting on this show. Did you? Yeah manifest like where you were going to live, uh -huh. what you were going to do. Big manifesto. Good given. Big How'd you do it? in my white <laughs> suit. Um, I did a Madewell thing, like a little campaign-y thing. Oh, yeah. And they were like, we're going to shoot at your apartment. And then they saw where I lived, and they're like, not that apartment. <laughs> and so then in the West Village where I wasn't living, they basically like took fake furniture and like made a better version of my own life, which was very eerie, Yeah, mm -hmm. but like kind of like a vision board in, in front of mm -hmm. you. Yeah. yeah. And so I stood there and I was like, I'm gonna live here one day. <laughs> and then a couple months later, the, the exact apartment next door opened up and I wrote a love letter to my now, landlord. Now, in a love the letter, love letter, did love you this. lie a little? I did. I said that I was conceived on Perry Street. <laughs> now you know where I live. Um, <laughs> which I wasn't, but my parents did date and like live together on that okay, block. Okay, so I walked maybe. by my dad's apartment a lot. That's so much fun. Um, yeah. And is it true that you keep wigs in your oven? I do keep wigs in my oven. It's well, hard to find storage in New York. You know York. what, you're right. It's true, so it's that crazy. means two things. You don't cook and you also have a lot of wigs. I have a lot of wigs, I don't cook. I also have a storage unit which is great you have a storage unit too yeah what about your cute dog do you let him on your cute couches it's torture yeah, yeah it's covered in fur mm -hmm. as i left him this morning now tell us oh. about your oh, oh, what's his is. name his he looks like a fox peach like the fruit peach, peach. Oh, peach yeah. is the new color of the season did you know that oh, is it pantone Pe oh pantone peach pantone always peach. Been in. wait peach. that's so exciting know, so you need to get Look something for him yeah um, there he is just destroying my furniture there i am with my new cleaning tool look at um, you okay let's talk saturday night yeah. live yeah Yes. This season has been so, so it's been good. Really it's good. been good. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about your favorite sketch? Yeah. Um, of yours, gosh. please. Oh, I mean, I was so excited to do that Britney sketch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Should, can we should take we a listen? look at this? Let's take a look. Why not? Oh. I'm touched that my book, The Woman in Me, hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list, to say the least. My audiobook is read by the amazing Michelle Williams, but she wasn't the only one who wanted to read it. Here's a peek at some of the other actors who auditioned to read The Woman in Me. Natasha Lyonne. Ah, uh, so at this point, I'm not a girl, but not yet a woman. I'm f in between, I don't know. Lindy Chalamet, take 27. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> Just read the lines, for sure, for please. Sure. Uh, uh, actually, I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> you were so crazy. Did you wait? Timothy Chalamet. Yeah, he was hosting. Hosted. So how was how that? Did he feel you know, about it? <laughs> he's okay with it. I do feel. Yeah, there he is. Uh -huh. There I am, lost, <laughs> looking at his backside. Are you right um, behind? No, that's Phoebe. no, that's Where Phoebe. Are you? You're, You're not Phoebe. People out. mistake us all the time. Uh -huh. um, no, he's such a sport about it. I'm so surprised. Do you always get good feedback from people you do impressions of? No. No. <laughs> who's um, giving you a bad one? Liked it. I've, someone's given me notes before, oh, like in no. DMs. You won't tell us who that person I'll is? I'll tell you after the camera okay. turns well, off. Well, you know what? Maybe this will change your mind. We've we've um, called in a special order, oh. which are these cheesesteaks from Bradley Cooper's food. Oh, crop. my oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh, wow, you guys are really going to eat them. Yeah, well, well no, we're going to share, share it you. you. But I'd be careful one. on your white suit. No, mm -hmm. yeah, My vintage. vintage uh, is this from Bradley Cooper's truck? Did Wait. Bradley Cooper touch this? <laughs> and so we'd like to sell it on eBay. Wow. Oh, there's a lot going on here. Oh, my. Why is it wrapped like this? I don't well, know. It's, it's like a... Gosh. Oh my God! I'm it's overwhelmed. Are you so Chloe? early in the morning? A lot. I'm deeply. Okay. This is the biggest thing I've ever seen. I'll do it. 
There you go. Is it a lot? A lot of yum. A lot. It's All good. Right. A lot of yum. You like it? <laughs> Stay right there. Chloe's going to stick around and show off some of her impressions after this. <laughs> With Saturday Night Live's Chloe Feynman, and since Ooh. she can nail an impression, we thought it'd be fun to play uh -oh. a game that we call Holiday Sing Machine. All right, Chloe, here's how it's gonna work. We're okay. Pull this candy cane lever. Mm -hmm. It's one of our favorite levers, and then the sing <laughs> machine <laughs> will generate. It's our only lever. Okay. A random character or celebrity, along with some kind of holiday activity. You're mm -hmm. gonna. These are your prop tables. You're gonna grab a prop. Okay. We'll have 15 seconds. Oh boy. Give us a scene. Oh, okay, here we go. You Chloe? up for it? Yeah, I had two coffees this morning. Two coffees ready and a to cheese go. Stick. All right, here we go. Yeah. I'm pulling the lever. Let's see what it starts off as. It is Meryl Streep oh. riding a Christmas card. Okay. Oh, well, what shall I? Oh, dearest Santa. <laughs> I would like a musical of um, holiday cheer. <laughs> and oh, what about chocolate and wonderful little <laughs> Gumdrops? Ooh. <laughs> yes! That? Yes! Gumdrops! Yes! yes. Okay. Goody, goody gumdrops! Oh, that is so good. Oh, okay, ready? Talented. Here we go again. Here we okay. go. Next Pull one. that lever. Pull it, and we got... Oh. Blueberry more making a pot. Okay. Oh, it's right here. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm here with my flower. <laughs> I love a pie. It's like truly a Thanksgiving food, but you can make it Christmas. <laughs> I'm gonna put candy and gumdrops and delicious. Oh, a chew! Oh my God, the flower is everywhere. Oh. <laughs> You somehow incorporated gumdrops into every skin. <laughs> yeah. Did I really? We oh. need more coffee. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Go. Here's another Pull one. Here's another one. Okay. okay, I got one. This, this is, is going to be good. a good one. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's see. We've got no gumdrops. Nicole, Nicole Kidman, Kidman oh. watching oh. a Hallmark Christmas, Christmas movie. movie. Okay. All right. I'm going to get my carsy little blanket <laughs> on. Oh. Oh. Oh, there you are. Oh, Hallmark. <laughs> So gorgeous. You know, we come to Hallmark. We come to this place for magic, for stories of uh, a girl who grows up on a Christmas farm and then meets the love of her life. Oh, oh she's going to save the Christmas farm. Oh, I'm going to turn up the volume. We have to let that, that go one is over. Okay, hold on. Let's okay, pull the lever. Pull okay, that candy cane so lever. Excited. Okay. Okay, ready. We've got Jennifer, Jennifer Coolidge. Oh, fine. Santa. Oh, okay. Give oh, yourself time this. to get prepared. Yeah, here we're we go. We're not ready yet. We're not rushing we're, you. We're gonna okay. restart the clock. Wow. Ready? Okay. Yeah. Go. Oh. <laughs> oh my God! It's Santa. <laughs> so high. Aren't you a cute little guy? Oh, you're. You're much more attractive in person. <laughs> oh, I have some uh, eggnog for you. Oh, let me give it a taste. <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. Oh, that has alcohol in it. <laughs> for you, Santa. <laughs> Yum. This is spiked. Yeah, what's what we do here? 
We want right. you to be a method actor, okay? Oh my okay. God, this one is like our job. Oh, wait, hold on. One more. We have is it just one more. Let's just see. Okay. Okay. All right. We we'll pull it. Let's more. see. We got Miley Cyrus draining oh. the eggnog for the first time. <laughs> now I know it's in it. <laughs> oh, cat. Oh, now I sound like John Burke College. All right. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to try this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that Jennifer Cullen? No, I can't get Jennifer. Get Jennifer drunk. out of you. Get her oh out. Oh, my God. <laughs> Y'all. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. That's basically right. if Jennifer <laughs> and Miley had a baby. By the way, you Chloe, are the, we you're adore the you. awesomest. We Thank love you. You guys. can catch Chloe on SNL at 1130 right here on NBC, streaming on Peacock. And this weekend, Ooh. your host is going to be Adam Driver, musical guest, yes. Olivia, Olivia Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Uh -huh. Are you Olivia Rodrigo fan? I adore her. Don't you love Driver's License? Yes. Driver, Adam Driver, Driver's License. Yeah, oh, there I you go. Huh. Doing She's enjoying that. that. Huh, I didn't think of that. Oh, okay, <laughs> Chloe, we love we love you, and we'll be there <laughs> for you. Coming up next, y'all, keep your holiday season healthy and happy. Therapist Nadra glover Tawab has some advice on setting boundaries right after this. family get-togethers, the holidays can be a very stressful time. And if you're like us, you're probably looking for a Christmas that's a bit more carefree. So today we're going to help you get, set some boundaries with therapist and best-selling author Nedra Glover Tawab, whose book is called Set Boundaries, Find Peace. Perfect title. Ugh. Perfect time of the year to have this discussion uh, because people are among family and there are these questions that no matter how many times they come at you, they're an ouch. Yeah. Mm. Why aren't you dating anyone? Why aren't you married? When are you going to have children? Like, how do you prepare yourself for something like that? You practice like you're about to give a speech. Oh. In the mirror, it's like, when Aunt so-and-so says, these are the comebacks I will have this holiday season. Often we don't prepare, and so mm. it's like shocking. It's like, oh, she asked again, but you know she's going to ask. Mm -hmm. You know this person so is going to So what is the answer? Why something. aren't you married? Like, that's a common one yeah. women get. Do we even want to answer it? Because maybe we'll, we're still exploring that. So yeah. saying, I'm not ready to talk about it. You know, this is something I think about too, and I don't want to respond yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, something it's, simple. And is there a way that you can create a boundary within yourself to know that probably the person does not trying to come from a malicious place, that maybe it's just filling space or right, they're, they're reflecting intent. their own things? Yeah, their intent on wasn't you. bad. Yeah, maybe they want us to be happy and their idea of happiness for mm -hmm. us is it's to different. be partnered yeah. and to have children right. or to have a job we love. And so they're saying these things that's a reflection of what they think about happiness for us. Sometimes when I get an ouch like that, I try to think of like, why was that so painful? Like, right. why do I, why am I right. upset by a simple question that somebody asked me? Is it because I do want a partner, kids, whatever the, the thing is. So sometimes it's- It's a teaching. Yeah, like teaches tool. you to figure out like what, what's up with me. Yeah, people teach us what our stuff is, what we still need to explore and discover. And sometimes when we are responsive to something, it's an opportunity for us to say, huh, okay, next Monday, that's where I'll start in therapy. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. On that exactly. topic. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to gifting. Yeah. It's that time of year. It can be tricky, right? Like yes. with the boundaries when it comes to people asking you for things, with money, what should we do? 
You know, I love to pull names, right? If you can't pull names, like if it's a large family, pull names. If you can't pull names, agreeing to buy only for kids or mm -hmm. we'll keep it in our household. But having some idea of this is what we'll do, we can start that conversation Black Friday so people aren't shocked when the right. holiday comes that they don't have a gift. So, you know, maybe you buy everybody something and other people don't. Like, yeah. is the expectation to receive? Yeah. Or if mm -hmm. we're in a position to give, is it just okay to give and not get anything? Well, sometimes yeah. it's hard when you're in a group and they're like, let's get a group gift, but you really either can't be in on it because you can't afford to be in on it. What's a way to sort of say... Um, I love y'all, but I'm not gonna. I want to be at the party, I'm, but I, yeah, I, I'm not. Yeah, I don't have a gift to bring. I love what you just said. What? You know, I want to participate, but I will not be in the gift exchange. But if you need help with decorations yeah. or you need someone to help you make the punch, I'm the person. But yeah. I don't want to be involved in the gift exchange. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about uh, hosting. Yeah, a lot of people have families come into their homes. Uh -huh. And sometimes it's the same patterns, right, that yeah. you see over and over again. How do we throw a boundary when it comes to that? Well, if you're aware that you don't want a particular family member or friend to stay with you, a way to respond to that is just to send them a list of hotels. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy you're coming to New York. Here are a list of hotels <laughs> near me, right? right? Like, yeah. that's the indicator, like, I'll see you. Right? Can you but, also just say my house is full, there's no room in the end? Yeah, but won't people just figure out a way to like, oh, we could just sleep on the couch uh, or the yeah, expectation. We don't, mind. We, don't mind. we don't mind or the expectation you, is you give your room up. Sometimes I wonder if like there are certain subjects that rear their ugly head once a year and it's like, oh, there that is again. And you know it's gonna happen around Christmas time. So mm -hmm. you see it coming. Let's say you it's let's say everyone's stomping all of your boundaries around Christmas time. <laughs> but you know that that's when it happens, and then back to normal again. Again. Is it sometimes okay to just go, this is when it rears its ugly head, we do it for a couple of days, and then we're back to life? It's okay to say, let's not talk about this. Yeah. You know, I know it's been our pattern to talk about it in yeah. the past. It's not productive. Yeah. It seems like a really stuck point for us. Let's stay, save it to January it. 3rd. Yeah. Let's take it away from the holiday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's also one of the reasons why they wear their ugly heads, all of these things, is that many of us are going back into our childhood yeah. homes and those same patterns are there. Right, mm -hmm. unresolved stuff. All of a sudden, yes. you're the little kid sitting at right. the dining room table. Right. There, is there anything you can do to prepare for that? Well, if you're the little kid sitting at the dining room table, you have to remember you're an adult now yeah. and the situation for you should be different. Mm -hmm. And so it is commanding the space and being an adult. And sometimes we expect our parents and our older siblings to yeah. release us from this little version of ourselves. But it's us. And it's, it's us. us. Okay, it's us. you have a very yes. cool deck of cards. I'd like called, to play this game. Called <clears throat> the Set a Boundary Deck. Yes. So you pull something from here let's so see what let's, let's see we'll what it says it. we pulled okay. it what does okay. it say it says time boundary you say yes to family invitations out of obligation even when it's inconvenient mm -hmm. yeah so what are we supposed to do with this yeah. discuss if that's us and how we Yes, yeah, you discuss it. So if you're doing this and this is an area of challenge to you how do you respond to it mm -hmm. you know i think about like if this invite happened for tomorrow not in 3 weeks would you go Mm -hmm. If they said, hey, tomorrow I'm having this thing, can you come? If it's like, no, mm -hmm. maybe it's a no for three weeks, too. Yeah. Like, it sounds mm -hmm. like something you're not deeply engaged mm -hmm. in. So maybe it's okay to say no now. I think learning how to say no yeah, and being one. okay with it. Right. Is and, a really important. And not boundary. worry that you're hurting someone's yeah. feelings. I love you, but I I can't do I it. I can't do it. And it's not a no forever. It's no to this thing, but yeah. please keep me, you know, in the loop with yeah. whatever comes up next. Right. Except <laughs> next year. Do not ask me. <laughs> or the year no, after that. I don't want to go. <laughs> and that's when you just stick to no. 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 <laughs> no I won't be available Friday or the following or the, Friday. I'm never available. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. I'm never available. Thank you, thank you. Coming up next, we're celebrating the first night of Hanukkah. Oh, our friend Gail Simmons is sharing one of her family's favorite recipes. That's after this. It's so funny. It's Thank so you true. so much. That's so cool. So you
Tonight is the first night of Hanukkah, and millions of families will be gathering to celebrate and enjoy a delicious meal That's together. So sweet. One a holiday dish that is always a crowd pleaser is latkes. And mm -hmm. here to share her family recipe. Did I say it right? <laughs> you did. Yes. Latkes. Oh, latkes. Latkes. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Gail Simmons is with us. Gail, From first Top of Chef. all, we adore you. Thank you. Um, so and I, you. Your family okay. has a special recipe that you make. It's basically a potato, potato It's a potato pancake. pancake. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Very special, right? Well, you know, these are the ones that my mother made for me every year, mm. always. I make them for my children, with my children. Like, I could never imagine a Hanukkah without them. Okay. But a potato pancake is a potato pancake. So there's really only a few ways to do it. <laughs> My sort of piece of controversy is that I use a food processor. Traditionally, Do some people say no. Well, most people use just a, a regular grater. Oh no! I find that this gives mm. them like, first of all, way easier. Second of all, long, beautiful strands. Look at that beautiful. Right. You just want to keep Wait, it going. So I have a, a whole a potato, quarter of yukon, yukon, gold, a good love. bacon potato. By the way, how, how satisfying is that? I love watching this right it now. It is right. I, know I we can need sit to move here. on. Okay. Onions. Onions. onions, no, onions no, that's all going. it is. Onions. Onions and, and potatoes, about three and a half pounds. Here we go. Wait, exactly. Look, how, look at all that water that came out. Oh, up, I right? know. So you have to strain it. Well, this it. is it. So you mix it up and then you literally squeeze, squeeze it. You can it. use cheesecloth, but you definitely want to let it sit for about 10, 15 minutes first. Because if you don't, they're, they're too soggy. wet. That's right. Potatoes are all water. Dill. Then another thing I love in my family recipe is lots and lots of herbs. So I have dill here that I I'm going to chop. I also have chives. Cut. Look at that. There you go. So Cutting guys. dill is very satisfying, right? Just give it a good chop. And I think that, first of all, potatoes in any case are like a blank canvas for flavor. 100%. Right? So you want that. They're a vehicle. Do it for me. So okay, for dill, 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 chives, chives, a little baking powder, two eggs lightly beaten. This is what's going to keep it together, right? That's exactly right. The flour and the eggs. And then you want some salt. And don't be shy here because, again, potatoes. Wow blank canvas and give it a good what, mix. Wait, what's going on with this? Well, this is oil and this is, you know, the miracle of light which is Hanukkah is all yes. about the oil. The uh -huh. miracle of the fact that the oil in one little lantern yes. after the destruction of the temple lasted eight days mm -hmm. and allowed them resilience, allowed mm -hmm. them to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this holiday is all about, about light and magic. So we mm -hmm. use oil, we right. use it for donuts, so we use it for latkes. Is this, a, and the, you, you filled the pan with oil and what kind of oil do you use? You know, a really like, neutral oil a canola oil, mm -hmm. grapeseed oil, and then you also actually want to strain these a little bit too. There's How still do you do a lot that? of you just put it over a Back strainer, over strainer, squeeze it out a little bit. Is You're going to see it's strained? this is it. So the eggs kind of come out. They don't. They really absorb, uh, okay. and then you'll see it won't be a problem <laughs> no, at all. But look at no. that water so after far, two I'm strains. Zero for all. <laughs> no, you don't have to worry. Uh, look. Okay, let's watch how we oh, do you're squeeze it. Squeeze it all out. Look yeah. at that. Give it a squeeze. I, I mean, this oh, is I how I do it. Come on. I like and then that, that yes. noise. I like that. Sneak down here. It's the it's the it's the so it's the best noise you, in the world. You're making a very special sauce. I am making a sauce. So while these are cooking, this is actually a sauce. I I didn't want to just do the traditional sour cream this year. This is strained lobka. It's a recipe I got from my. Dear so friend, good. Michael Solomonov, an incredible restauranter in Philadelphia. Mm. And he makes this really delicious it's amazing. modern uh, lob recipe. So it's oh my God. cubed apples, mm. red onion, a mm. lot more of those herbs. So I have parsley, I have dill, dill chives, oh some lemon juice. Uh. And a little bit of salt, of course. Mix it all up. And that, to me, is the Gail. ultimate delicious dip Gail. for my Gail, mom's We adore latkes. you. Happy Gail. Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. This is a beautiful dish. Thank you. Mm. We're we sending so you. much Peace love. Peace and light to everyone this to year. To you too, Gail. Thank yes. you. you too. To get this recipe, mm. head to today.com slash food. Coming up next, elevating your holiday entertaining. Uh, Nathan Turner has some creative and delicious ideas after this. This is sick. This is so They're yummy, right? Yeah.
All right, if you like to entertain during the holidays, we are going to show you how to kick it up a notch. Interior decorator and author of I Love California, Nathan Turner, is here to help you add a festive touch to your home decor, and he may be our favorite person on earth. Because look at his sweater. Please. Just look I at mean, his sweater. It's the season of a carefree Christmas. I mean, you have a fancy carefree yeah. Christmas sweater. If you're going to do it, do it right. That's right. amazing. We wondered why moments before we went on the air, you had on a parka. I had but now we know. Now, now we understand. You're like, are you sick? We understand. <laughs> I know. She was scared to get close to you. Okay, let's talk entry. Entry is yeah. the most important thing. Yeah. It's yeah. the first thing everybody sees. And most sings. of us live in small apartments, so yeah. it's the only yeah. place you have to decorate. So it's sure. compact. So Put your wreath on your mirror. Oh, that's Most people smart. have a mirror on the entry. Yeah. It's easy on and off. I get those removable, those little removable yeah. hooks. Yeah. It goes right on the glass. Mm -hmm. Comes off easily. And then womp it up with a bow. Well, I your bought, bow is fab. That is. I bought lot. this bow. And then I just added ribbon. You oh. can add ribbon and use two-way tape, so and you're done. That looks. that looks really okay, good. This okay, this is also, you always wonder, what do you do with the old Christmas, Christmas cards? cards? I've done everything with them, but I like this. I, you know, you put your special ones, your family, clip them on your Lamp. lampshade. And, I think that's so smart. Yeah. What's this little? These are personalized Christmas crackers, and I just thought they were super charming. We have Jenna, we have Hoda. Where do we you have, get those? I got these on Etsy, which is just like, you know, if such a source. If you're having one Christmas meal, it's really cute thing for a name card. Super, right. Put it but up I love on their personalizing place something and look in at your the, entry. I'm sorry, but just so adding these cute. little cranberries. Look yes. what that does. So little effort, and it makes like a little punch, and it's so welcoming. Love it. Love all of it. All right, let's come to our table and our sweet treats. We cannot get over we how can't. gorgeous Isn't this it? white table it's is. Gorgeous. I love a white Christmas, a white moment, because yeah. it kind of transcends holidays. It could be Hanukkah. It could be Christmas. This could be New Year's, pretty New Year's mm -hmm. Eve. You're right, you're right. So I started with this great, quote, tablecloth. <gasps> I rarely buy tablecloths. What is this? I got it at Joanne's Fabrics. No, you didn't. It's, it's like a just sweater. Like, it's like a sweater. That's what it is. And I just cut the yardage I need for my table. Wait, I love going it. to Joanne's for a tablecloth is a genius. Brilliant. Smart. It's genius. inexpensive, Smart. and you get Very exactly smart. what you want. Okay. okay, what about the place settings? Okay, place settings, I go stick with the, like, white and silver. So what silver have you done? Look, there. Wally. I don't know who Wally is. But you have this. Dog. Oh, <laughs> your, is dog? your dog eat at the table yeah. with you? Oh, he could. So what did you, know. you do? You put the names. How did you stick? I just them opened up the top, and then you can, you know, on the ornaments, and, and then just, just pop, it in. pop it in. Yeah. And, stick and you it. know what? A good thing is these Plastic. are plastic. Yeah, they must so be. So people they can take them home. Okay. And now what? I love these drinks where you freeze a little ice, ice cube water with, with a little sprig of rosemary. Oh, and God. Pomegranate. It looks like a Christmas, Christmas tree. tree. So festive. Like tree. This is just water, and I'm loving it. Right. Oh my god! Refreshing. All yeah. right. So what about okay, these? This sweet is my treats. favorite thing. It's centerpiece that's edible. Okay. So why not put your desserts out? They're beautiful. Now but it's can part you of your eat this? Yes. How do you do that? You can just pull, pull one off. Right off. I know. Oh, you put them in sticks. Yes. Those are toothpicks, and then the other ones <laughs> are done with like frosting. And here's that. You take one of these. Forms. What is that? It's just like a foam. Styrofoam. styrofoam oh, that you form. get at the, um, uh -huh. like, MJ Design. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then you, you wrap it in foil uh -huh. and use royal icing, which is like a really heavy, strong icing. And then what? And you then start Stick to apply Look meringue. I mean, for a, a holiday table to just be able to eat just these this. desserts, we got to just show one more thing. One more cube. Yeah. These fancy the, cubes. Yeah. Fancy cubes. It's the same. Um, and what's oh, that? And what's the almond? This is a, it's cheese? a cheese ball oh. made up like a pine cone. Super easy to do. Just shape it and then put almonds all over Beautiful. it. Beautiful. I like cheese. I don't know that I like cheese balls, but I love you. And <laughs> By I love the way, this sweater. we're going to take, we're going to fight yeah. over it. You know that's happening, Jen well, we got We got to get you guys one. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. We will. Okay. And we'll be back we'll right be back. after this. We're not going to fight on his white Wait, table. I see this that's one. rude. Oh, no, I'm serious. It's, She's going to try to take it off your body. She said, Jeff, you tell the ladies if they want one.
new episode of the Reba Jenna podcast drops today. That's right. Our pal Joe Fryer sits down with famed children's book author Mo Willems. Oh. He's the best. To hear that full conversation, just scan the QR code on the screen or search for Read with Jenna wherever you listen to your podcast. Tomorrow, Emmy winner Eric Stone Street is going to swing by. Plus, YouTube sensation and talk show host Terrell Grice. And author Ramon Alam shares his list of books that will make great gifts. Okay, you guys, we're almost there. We love you. Bye. Have a carefree Christmas. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. Happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. First of all, it's so good to see you. When you walk in, it's like sunshine has arrived in our little dark room. It's your season. Christmas is here. So question first, is your Christmas tree up? Oh, of course. My Christmas tree was up before Thanksgiving. We, and the day after Thanksgiving, we turned all the Christmas lights on in my yard, in my house. I mean, yeah, so I'm always about Christmas. Now, I have, one, wait. Other, I have one other question for you. When do you take all of those Christmas decorations down? The first down? week after uh at first of the year. So you feel Sometime like that's... Sometime within that year, yeah. I'm only going... Sometimes I'll keep a few little things. My birthday's the 19th of January. Of course. Sometimes I'll keep a few little things in the house. Just think, well, I'll celebrate my birthday with, with a little tree, maybe in one room or Sweet. so. Sweet. <laughs> you, you've had so many Christmas memories since you were a little girl to today. Is there a Christmas that kind of stands out to you? Like, a lot of people say it was maybe before, even before all the fame and before all that. Like, is there one that sticks out to you and you say that Christmas. Well, that memory I actually made a movie of called Circle of Love. That was when my mom and dad had been married for years, had a house full of kids, and mom had never had a wedding ring because they married when they were 15 and 17 years old. So I remember all of us making up money to help buy mama a wedding ring, mm -hmm. and we all got to be part of that and remembering how special that was back there in the country and mama, you know, being so happy and surprised about a ring and it made a wonderful story. But I have tons, tons of memories. A little yeah. brother that was born around Christmas time because we always wanted our walking, talking dolls. Mm -hmm. Mom said, well, you got one that really pees and really cries <laughs> and really does all the stuff that you're wanting that little doll to do. Here you are. So I have a lot of precious memories being from the country and, you know, being back Back oh. in the backwoods where you make your own fun, you make your own Christmas. And you make your own memories. Boy, yeah. you've got some good ones. I want to talk about that, but I want to talk about this movie that you have out called Dolly Parton's Mountain Magic Christmas. This is all parts of you. <gasps> Dolly Parton, Christmas, Dolly. I'm starting to cry just thinking about it. It's got all your friends. It's a beautiful story of putting on a show. It's a musical. It's a movie. When I saw it, I was like, that is so Dolly. That's all of it. Well, we're so excited about the, the movie. And of course, we did it at Dollywood, mm -hmm. which is my theme park up in mm -hmm. East Tennessee, where I was born and raised. It's like a, a movie set anyway, some sure. of everything. And so we invited all these wonderful guests, like Jimmy Fallon, uh -huh. uh, you know, who's on the show. And so we've had all these great you know people on and great actors. We did a show about, a, it's like a show within a show, because mm -hmm. I think people are real interested in knowing what goes on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So we made it where we really made it like how the show was going on, all the things that can go wrong 
behind the scenes, but then we actually did the numbers as if they were rehearsals, getting ready to actually do it live sort of thing. So it's a lot of drama, it's a lot of comedy, a lot of meaningful songs, a lot of meaningful places, stuff for kids, you know, we got sing-alongs with the kids, so, uh, and getting to do it at home was I, great for me. I mean, the list of celebrities is pretty amazing. It's Willie Nelson, it's Jimmy Allen, it's your goddaughter, Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus, And her, and her daddy, And her Billy daddy, Cyrus. Billy, Billy, <laughs> Billy Ray. And we've got Jimmy Fallon. I mean, the list is it like, is wow, wow, Zach wow. Zach Williams doing our great Grammy Come winning on. song. There was Jesus, which is perfect for oh. the show. And so, yeah, we got the Fallons and the Allens. And and we and Willie, it was a dear thing to me to get to work with Willie again. We've been friends since we were both fairly young in Nashville. Was it so fun? It, it seemed to me, there are a lot of sets that seem like work, but this thing seemed different to me when I was watching it. Because I, I, I got to see uh, parts of this already, and it looked electric, like you'd want to see this on Broadway kind of thing. Oh, well, good, and you might. But I had a lot of my family participate, sure. a couple of my sisters, Cassie and Rachel, a lot of my nieces, my little grandnephew, Liam, plays the little elf. And so we've just got all kinds of stars, all kinds of wonderful actors playing the parts of the people behind the scenes. So you and Jimmy Fallon have a song. It's called Almost Too Early for Christmas. Okay, you heard the song. What was the first thing you thought when you heard it? It's almost too early for Christmas. Why don't we see how it goes? Well, I, first of all, there was a little backstory to okay, that. Jimmy me. was going to be on my Christmas show. He said, let me send you the song and see what you think. And he sent that to me, though, like in September. And so it was called Too Early for Christmas. I thought, wow. What a great idea for a yeah. song. It's almost too early for Christmas because the Halloween decorations are still out and the Christmas haters and all. So he <laughs> sent me the song and I just loved it. He said, would you sing on it with me? Because we'd done Mariah Carey's song in my Christmas album of All I Want for Christmas is You. Yeah. So I knew he could sing good and we sounded good <laughs> together. I just love him and he sings great. He's just an all-around great guy. Isn't he? I know, and y'all sitting in that booth singing that song was so cute. Oh, I loved I it. Know. I loved it. It's so cute, yeah. Yeah. back home for just a minute, if you wouldn't mind. So you were uh, the fourth child in your family of mm -hmm. how many kids? Well, there's 12. Mom and Daddy had 12 children, six boys and six girls. Mm -hmm. And so we had a big, big family and we lived back in the woods, but we had a good time. And, you know, we just loved each other. And Christmas, we made Christmas, whatever. We made it. Mama was always great to make everything seem fun and happy and made things more exciting than they were. And so we just <laughs> did what all country people do. We made the most of it. One of my favorite questions to ask somebody, because I feel it's it's such a window into their life, is close your eyes for a second. Okay. And then imagine your childhood bedroom. Look around. See what around you see. In, with my eyes closed? I'm with looking, your, what okay, am look, I looking look, for? You're, you're just looking at your room. and Or <laughs> who, who was okay. with you in your room? Were there anything on the walls? Were there multiple <laughs> kids? What, where did you sleep? Like, what was that childhood Actually, bedroom Actually, I don't have to close my eyes okay. to see that room. <laughs> because me. we, you know, in the early days, you know, we, we lived a few different places. But in the early days, you know, we, our house was really small. And mom and daddy had a little separate 
area where they slept. But we mostly just piled up. We had two or three beds, and we had three or four kids sleeping in, in a bed, and some of them peed in the bed, and we just dealt with that too. And it was cold in the winter. We'd fan the cover, get cold with that. But anyway, I just we just loved with Daddy get up building the fire in the mornings. And, you know, Daddy, is the fire hot? You know, is the fire hot? <laughs> That's what y'all said. Up. Yeah, and so we didn't. He wouldn't let us get up till the house was warm because it was cold in our old houses. But anyway, I just remember things hanging on the wall would be like a picture of Jesus, or those little two little kids, two little orphans crossing a bridge, and you know those famous little pictures you see yeah. the Lord's Supper in the kitchen hanging on the wall, and or coats and hats and whatever. But we just lived a simple rural life like so many country people do. But but it was a house full of love and, and warmth. And so even though it was cold outside, it was warm mm. in our hearts. Who, who taught you about generosity? Oh, that was, I, that, I'm from a faith-based family. Yeah. My grandpa yeah. was a preacher. So when you grow up like that, you, you're supposed to, it's better to give than receive. Although as kids, we, we loved getting the presents, you know, whatever we got. But I think you, I just always had a, a giving spirit, the same as my mom. And my dad were just good-hearted country people. Did you remember witnessing it, or was it just part of life? It was part of life. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was, it was the way you survived in the country. Everybody yeah. had to help everybody else. If it was hog-killing time, the neighbors knew who, who, whose day that was, or if they would go help somebody in the crops. If it was, you know, if, you were, if your tobacco crop was money, which ours was, yeah. different neighbors would come to help, and they worked at different times. So it was just what, how you survive in the country, and I think you just kind of learn to do that, and that just follows you all the days of your life. Faith is such a big part of your life. When would you say that your faith was tested the most? Well, I think we all go through things in yeah. our lives, and I don't know for certain. There's been several times people always, and, and I talk about that in the special, people always act like I'm sort of an angel. I say, I'm no angel. I just play one on TV. <laughs> it's tough out there. I just try hard, and I try no matter what I'm going through, and we all go through all sorts of things, but I just try to rely on that faith mm. and believe that through God all things are possible mm. and that I'm going to survive and that I can survive because I have faith to do it. And a lot of people depend on me. And there's a saying in Scripture, I believe, that says, to whom much is given, much is required mm -hmm. or much is expected. So anytime I get to you know, feeling too far down or feeling too sorry for myself, I just think about that and think, well, God has blessed me in so many ways, so why am I going to wallow around in my little dab mm -hmm. of sorrow? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. When uh, the holidays are festive, and I want to talk about all that, but it also does bring back memories for a lot of people. And in the country music world, Loretta Lynn and Naomi Judd passed oh, wow. th this just, just over these past months. And loss is something that people deal with differently. And I just was curious how you deal with loss, like, of them. Well, those things are very special. Like with Loretta, I, she was very dear to me, like a sister. Same with uh, Naomi. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we, we were same age, and we loved the same things. And I loved her. And then I also lost Kenny Rogers, mm -hmm. three of my dearest mm -hmm. people in the business in a very short period of time. And I grieve over them almost like you do a family mm -hmm. member. And I think of them, and but you try to keep the good memories. You don't try to try to dwell. You're sorrowful, of course, of the loss and when it happens. But then you allow yourself to just think of all the things that you remember about them that is added to your life, mm -hmm. and remember what they did for all the millions of people, that, the lives that they touched. And so you just think you're just thankful that you got to know them. And that you got to share that time, like you said. There's that old song you talked about memories. Mm -hmm. There's that, that old mm -hmm. song of precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul, how they linger ever near me. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. and then it's like the line I love in that song is precious memories, unseen angels mm -hmm. sent from somewhere to my soul. And I think about that, you know, like those precious memories. They're like they just flow in and out of you, and mm -hmm. you remember special things Ooh. about them. And so I love that line in that song. Oh my God, that's so beautiful. I feel very weepy. Yeah. I don't know why. I think oh, well, just that's listening. Just like to, that's just a beautiful touches. line. Yeah. And that's how it feels, you know, like the unseen angels. And you feel like they're still all around you. You feel and that? you feel them, yeah. Mm. Boy, that's so beautiful. I feel like the other, there's so many magical parts about you, but it's that you keep um, you are evolving through life. And I've listened to Miley Cyrus, your goddaughter, say, I learned this from Dolly, I learned that from Dolly, I learned this from Dolly. <laughs> 
But then I was wondering, what is she teaching you? What are you learning about life from Miley? Well, I'm just learning Miley <laughs> as we go. Yeah. Well, I love Miley. And, you know, even when Miley goes through Miley's things, when back when she was making her transition from the Hannah Montana mm -hmm. little thing, trying to get to grow up, and yeah. people were not allowing her that. And, and I would, they were telling me, you got to talk to Miley. I said, look, you will never have me say nothing bad about Miley because Miley is so gifted, so talented, so smart. Sure. I love her. Like you love your child, you watch them grow and you love to see them blossom. And so I just, I've watched her and I'm, I really admire her, her talent mm -hmm. and how she conducts herself. She knows who she is. She does. And she's doing it her she? way. I've always done it my way. And I hope she learned a little bit of that from me. Yeah. That be you. It's like I say to her, you be you and I'll be me. And together, you know, we'll be us and that'll be a beautiful thing. And uh, she was on my Christmas show, as sure. we mentioned. And then I'm also uh, hosting. I know. The, uh, yeah, her oh. New Year's Eat party from Miami. And so we're so excited about that because Lord what knows is what's going to happen then. I was going to say, you and Miley hosting a New Year's Eve special yeah. is like the perfect combination. I so, think what so is going to go down? Give me a little. We don't know. You don't know? We're going to do a couple of skits and we're going to do a, <laughs> a song, a couple of songs, maybe do something with Def Leppard, Wait, uh, a rock song. Well, you know, I'm now a rock star. <laughs> So I'm going to sing a little something with them, and we're going to do a couple of a duets, some, some medleys, and we might even sing Jolene, you know, toward the end. But uh, we're, I don't know how much I should tell without Molly kicking my butt, because I don't know how much is going to be a surprise. I do basically know what we're doing. Okay. But there's so much of us that's hosting that will just be us being yeah. us, and no scripts, no nothing. I'm sure we'll have some guidelines that we'll have to follow yeah. for the timing. But yeah, sure. I have no idea what we're going to wear, which I'm going to probably be a little more bold than of normal. Of course. You've and got Miley to. is always bolder than normal. So I, I think it's going to be fun. Will and from Miami. From Miami. Will there be cocktails or are you a no cocktail person? Oh, well, at, at New Year's Eve? Yeah. Uh, whether I was or whether I wasn't, <laughs> I'm going to have a, a shine girl moonshine cocktail. <laughs>
done some rock and roll things or rock, you know, covered some rock uh -huh. and roll songs, but I never thought of myself as a, a rock star. When people say, oh, you're a rock star, you know, that was just them saying, oh, you're cool or whatever. You know right. how people say, ah, you're a rock star. But my husband loves rock and roll, but I'm, you know, I've just done everything in country and I know how hard you work at your craft. Sure. And when they, they said they wanted to put me in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and there were so many other people, I also thought that they just voted on that and it was like that person was going to go in. And I thought, I am not taking any votes from any of these people that spend their lives doing that like I spend my life doing this. Yeah. And so I found out later that they give it to you for if you've influenced other people. And other, you know, I found out more about it. Mm -hmm. But I had said at the start I didn't want to, to accept it because I didn't think I'd earned it. Mm. And still ain't sure. <laughs> but I thought, well, time is good. You know me, I'm about time. And I thought, well, if they're going to give it to me anyhow, I'm going to accept it gracefully. Oh. And then I'm going to go ahead and do a rock album and just make the most of it. Okay, Carl Dean, your husband of 56 years, um, he loves rock and roll. So is he thrilled that you're doing a rock album? Well, he's praying for me, I think. <laughs> I guess he's hoping I can pull it off, but I really think it's some of the best work I've ever done. I think wait, I've already done it. For real? I've already been working on it. It's going to come out next fall. Wait, wait, wait. The best work you've ever done? I think so. Only because it's different for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I worked, you know, I wanted it to be good. I didn't want anybody to be able to criticize me too much. They might, anyhow. But I really think people might be surprised because I've loved these songs for years. Yeah. And the songs that I chose, I chose a lot of the songs he loved. And then some that I loved, and I wrote a few things too. And Kent Wells, my longtime uh, musical director, band leader, guitar player, uh, he produced it. I just knew he was right because he's always kind of he's got mm -hmm. that inner rock, rock and roll in him. Sure. So he did a wonderful job, and we used all these great rock musicians. And I'm going to have a lot of the uh, iconic singers join me on several of the That's songs. Cool. Well, I'm asking, yes. but Pat Benatar is going to join me on something, and Pink is going to join me Pink. on, don't you love, love. her? I did great songs like uh, uh, Purple Rain, mm. did my version of a lot of songs that I love, that people love, so I've got a lot of word out to a lot of people, so we'll see who winds up on it. You know what, this is so cool. I'm sitting here listening to you, and you're doing something for the first time. People don't often do something for the, for the first time, but you, I feel like, you get out of your comfort zone. You're like, I do this and now I'm gonna do that. Like, will you tell me about that part of your life? Well, I just work whatever feels right. You know, I've always kind of just rolled like a river. You know, I just let the let it flow. I just kind of yeah. let God lead me, so to speak. And it just seems to be the right time to do certain things. And here I am at 77 years old. On, Next girl. year when I come out, I'm gonna be a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> for a minute, but I really, I gave it, I give it all I got, whatever it is. And so I did not want to be embarrassed by doing a rock album. So I really gave it all I had and I'm just hopeful that people are going to, well, hopefully they'll just accept it because they Love put it. me in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> so if I'm going to be there, I'm going to, I will feel like, you know, I feel like I need to earn it. So uh -huh. this is my contribution back to say thank you for putting me in there. So now maybe, you know, I can rest rest easy that I might have earned it.
Jeff Bezos recognized wow. that he thought he was going to give one of his huge grants to you to distribute for your charities. What did you make of it when you got well, the call from Well, you know, Jeff Bezos? it happened. Same day that I was being inducted into the Hall of Fame, I got a call saying Jeff Bezos uh, wants to speak to you, and here's his number. He wants, he's at home waiting for you to call. So and I thought, what is he calling me for? I thought maybe they wanted me to do a commercial for Amazon or <laughs> something. You know, I thought, well, that's weird. But of course, out of respect, you call. And uh, then we talked for a little bit. And then when he, he told me, I said, are you telling me that you're giving me $100 million for, for my charities? And he said, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. No strings attached, except that it all has to go to sure. you know, charity. And I started to cry on the phone. And it was just really like, I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a little, you know, I, it really moved me. I mean, it just to think that I was thinking, you know, what a generous thing to do. And then I was just thinking of all the great things that I could do for so many needy people. And I just thought, wow, thank you, God. You know, and it was like, um, it was amazing. It was, it was just out of nowhere. And just, I, I guess you can imagine what a wonderful day that was, getting put in the Hall of Fame and then also getting that. Because I spent about $1,000 buying tickets for the lottery for that $2 billion. <laughs> A lottery thing, and then of course I didn't win any of that. And then I, that same day I won, you know, not won. I felt like I'd won the lottery by, you know, getting that hundred million dollars to help all these wonderful causes. But I really think whether it's his money or whoever's money, I think if you're in a position to help, you should, and you you should choose things close to your heart that you can be proud of to represent and be out there and feel good about what you've done. So it's you're supposed to help one another. Can I ask you the most basic of questions? Why do you sing? Why do I sing? Because I can't help it. <laughs> I mean, that's who I am. That's what I do. I was, my grandpa said I came out uh, crying in the key of D, so they named me Dolly. <laughs> but anyway, that music is a big part of my family. It's just, it is in my DNA. And so I sing because that song, I sing because I'm happy, you know. I sing because I'm free. I sing, you know, because I have every reason in this world to sing. And so I love it, and that's what I do. Well, you don't do it for the money, and you don't do it for the fame. I know that for sure, because I, I feel I would like do it without the fame and the money. I've always said I yeah. would, if I worked as a waitress, because I love to sing and write, I'd be saving my tips to make demo records, to send to Nashville, to try to get my songs recorded, or be singing in the local bar or at the county fair or wherever I could. I'm certain that I would sing no matter what my life would have been. Let's talk New Year's resolution since this is, you are coming up on this Miley, the special with Miley Cyrus. What, what do you have on your list? Well, I'm like everybody else. You know, you make a bunch of resolutions and you never keep them. No. Third weekend of January, that's just all forgotten. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I hope, my hopes for the new year is I think what all good-hearted, faith-based people are just good. You don't even have to be faith-based, just good people are hoping for a little more kindness, a little more love, a little more trying to pull together instead of falling apart. And one of the songs I wrote for my rock album is called The World's On Fire. And it's about that whole, you know, liar, liar, the world's on fire. What you gonna do when it all burns down? Liar, liar, the world's on fire. But we still got time to turn it all around. It's like an anthem and it's all about what's going on. And it's, uh, and so that's what I'm hoping and praying for that in the new year that we can try a little harder. We've been through so much with the pandemic all over the world though, with just the weather and all the, yeah. you know, just the scary stuff, the scary earthquakes stuff. and things. It's just, you just think, well, you gotta think positive. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this Christmas show mm -hmm. because I felt like I needed to help if I could, to bring some brightness and lift people's hearts up a little bit and, and really just, uh, you know, sing some songs that are, meaningful, tell some stories that are fun, and just take people's minds off of that. But I'm just hoping that next year and the year after and the years to come that we can, we've learned a little bit about what's going on and how long can we go, you know, like that. Can't we rise above? Can't we show some love? Can't we just lift up and, you know, just help, help each other out? You know, it's like, one of those things, can't we just, you know, move on? And we we all feel the same. We cry, we hurt, we bleed, we suffer. You yeah. know, we all want, yeah. you know, we all want to, you know, things for ourselves. But Lord, why can't we just 
pray about it and think about it. And even if you're not even, a, like I say, a faith-based person, you've got to believe in good. And just like in yes. my show when I said, you know, a lot of people don't believe, you know, in in heaven. I would say, well, I do. And if I, if there is a heaven, I hope to hell I go. And I'm <laughs> going to be working at it, you know, trying to get there because I'm going to try my best to try to bring as much joy as I can and lift people up as much as I can in my way. And I just think we all need to try a little harder. I don't care what our politics or our religion or our color or anything else. We need to try a little harder. So that's that's my personal New Year's resolution, to try a little harder myself, to try to make as much of that happen as I can through songs or through giving or through whatever it may be. Dolly, you're such a delight. It's such an awesome human being. I mean, well, so are you, and thank you. Like I say, I ain't all, I ain't all that, but I appreciate the compliment. And I've got a lot of wonderful people in my life that help me look really good. So I always like to thank them for it. So I just get to get out here and take a lot of credit for a lot of hard work that a lot of other people do. But we're getting it done, and that's the main thing. Love you. Yeah, thank you. Season's greetings, everyone. The holidays are upon us, and we are ready to celebrate right here on Today All Day. From tips for that turkey to cooking up your very first holiday spread, we have got you covered. So tune in to Today All Day, all season long. Greetings, everyone. The holidays are upon us, and we are ready to celebrate right here on Today All Day. From tips for that turkey to cooking up your very first holiday spread, we have got you covered. So tune in to Today All Day, all season long. Savannah, you got to catch up with one of probably your most favorite people, Miss mm. Kristen Chenoweth. Oh, she's a legend. You yeah. know, she was just down the street. She met us at historic St. Patrick's Cathedral. Honestly, we could have talked for hours. Kristen, of course, needs no introduction. She's a Tony and Emmy winner and has transformed Broadway with her starring roles in Wicked and You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Well, she credits God and her faith with helping her get to the main stage. And as a Christian, she believes it's her mission to share God's love. And whether that is on the Broadway stage or walking down the streets of New York, she's finding a different kind of voice. I can't believe we're here. Can you believe we're here? You got your start singing in church. I did. Not a church like this one, though. Oh, no, no. Uh, mine was in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and it only had about 1,000 people in, in membership. But God was a huge part of my life. How I found my gift was through church music. What does it feel like to sing a great hymn, like How Great Thou Art, and be able to sing it like you? I feel, <laughs> thank you so much, you make me cry. It's, it gets me back to my roots. Whenever I sing, you mentioned Great is Thy Faithfulness earlier, and I, Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, I just, the echo. Morning by morning, morning new, new mercies, mercies I see. Take my mic down. <laughs> Never. You have a song in your heart, and you should sing it. Maybe not as loud as me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not as loud as you. I'll lip sync. Would you say you first found your voice in yeah. church? I was in the choir, little kids' choir, and my, they were having an audition for an adult solo. And my mom said, you can't, you're a kid. I said, let me just go try out. You know, that says a lot about me at that age. So I went and I got the solo. They were like, we're gonna give it to you. And then that Sunday I sing the solo and the church erupts. And I say this story only to tell you that when you're a little kid and the encouragement you get from people that love mm. you to follow the passion that you love, I was given an opportunity to sing about something that I believe in, which is faith and do it in front of people who love me, a very safe space. It started the ball rolling. And I love to sing for all kinds of faiths because I believe that we, we worship a God that is loving, not one that is man has made. So you're going to hell mm. and a loving God. And if I can spread that joy 
then I'm gonna try because that was one of the things God told me when I was a little girl. People go, oh, he actually, he spoke, hey, Chris, you know? Yeah. I get these impressions on my heart. I don't know how else to explain it. It's a still small voice. And when I get that impression, it's like a handprint, like, yes, that's correct. It's interesting about God's voice because um, it's hard to describe, although actually I think you describe it really well. Thank you. But I often find it is saying something that is unexpected. Yes, yes. I remember Savannah even talking about my adoption. And I've just started talking about it recently because, because I got the impression in my heart, this will help other people. People need to know that you just weren't in, in this world magically. They need to know what was behind it. It will inspire people. And so it's become a lot more easier for me to talk about. But if I couldn't listen, I would have kept that secret. And I'm not ashamed of it. Kristen was adopted as a newborn. Her adoptive mother happened to be in the hospital the same day she was born for an operation that would leave her unable to conceive. By chance or heavenly plan, Kristen unexpectedly became available for adoption. She said to the doctor, I always wanted to try for a little girl and now I won't be able to. And he remembered that story. So when my birth mom, Mama Lynn, came to give birth, she they called my dad before and said, do you want to surprise Junie tomorrow? Because I've got a little baby here that's going to need a home. And my dad said, yeah. And so they kind of took my mom, robed her up and day of her surgery and took her down to the babies. And they said, see that baby? That's your baby. So she's waiting on you when you get done. And so we went home together and she said, I always felt like I had you because we went home together. Mm. And I mean, how can I, me personally, not believe in miracles? Mm. I got the perfect family. I was brought into this world by the wonderful mother, Mama Lynn. And I was able to get an education. I grew up in a loving, giving family, one full of faith and a lot of fun too. Mm. And, you know, it's a gift gift so that's a miracle but how does mama lynn did she sing yes okay and the, my birth father was a great musician as well mm -hmm. billy etheridge and some people might know who he is out there but so i know where it came from mm -hmm. and she's petite i got her height people say nature versus nur mm -hmm. nurture i think no nature and nurture mm -hmm. is what it is it's such a beautiful alchemy this story you know it's yeah. like this magic it's divine it's divine it's divine you've had ups and downs in your career. You talked about how you've looked for God's voice yeah. to guide you. Yeah. How has that helped you make decisions that might have been a little surprising at the time, or a little yeah. unorthodox or off the beaten path? It's been really interesting because I have a, a wonderful team that works for me to help me guide with these decisions. Even when I was younger, I was lucky enough to get a great agent. I went to New York with my friend Denny to help him audition and get settled in. And I thought, maybe I'll just try out for something for fun, have the experience. And I ended up getting this part. And I had a big decision to make. And this is where I talk about the gut. This is where I talk about that impression. Some people call it the universe, that's fine. For me, it's the Lord. But I have to get quiet. My whole life I've heard from my aunts and my mom, two ears, one mouth, Kristen. Two ears, one mouth. <laughs> Speak less and listen more, because you know I can talk. <laughs> And when I do that, I'm able to kind of hear what God wants from me. And I went to New York. I said, I want to do this thing and it worked out. So God has other plans sometimes. And it's happened several times in my career. But faith is a journey and not always an easy one. Along with great success, Kristen has had great setbacks, including an onset accident that nearly killed her a decade ago. Severely injured, the road back was a crucible. It was horrific and scary and awful. Now, I could go in the path of bitterness and anger, and I did for a while, I did. But I could let all that go. It happened. So guess what I'm gonna choose? That way. And a lot of it is up to us. He gave us a mind and for me to just, I don't guess I'm preaching, but for me to talk about that, that'll be something I really want people to know.
Have you ever had doubt, seasons of doubt or disconnection with God? Yes. The big question of why God me? Yeah. Why me, God? I've had several injuries. You know, I'm in a, I'd like to say I'm an athlete. All my Broadway people know what I mean. People that tour, they know what I mean. I asked my mom one day, this was after this accident. I had to kind of relearn how to get some of my sentences out, land the plane, so to speak. I, my physical, physical body is not the same as it was. And I had a big pity party. And they, were, they stayed with me for three months to help me walk and things. She said, why not you? I said, what do you mean? Like, I'm crying. She goes, of course, do I want this for my daughter? No. But why not you? You know better or worse than anybody else. Things happen to everybody. You're on a mission to spread the love of God. I mean, that's it. Wait, that's you it. know, but also when you do fall and you mess up, and we all have, you get this amazing gift, which is God's grace. It's an incredibly bonding experience with God. When you know you did something wrong and you feel that on your heart, you are forgiven. I mean, you're so right to bring that up, Grace. Growing up, my mom always said, Junie, Chenoweth, I love you. She said, uh, if you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's but hard. It's hard. And it's later in life because I'm a Leo and I'm very loyal and I expect it back by people that love me. And when I've been hurt in the past, I have held on to it and it has hurt me. So just recently, this is a, a fact, I've started forgiving people that I feel have hurt me that don't even care anymore or know about it because <laughs> I'm the one that's hurting and that's God's grace. He says, see my child, if you'd done this the whole time, you wouldn't have carried that, that on your journey. I think that's so unique to God's character, if you will. When he tells us something, even something we don't really want to do, like forgive someone who hurt you. Yeah. He's not doing it for them. He's doing it for you. Yeah, it's true. And I've had trouble, more trouble, Savannah, learning to forgive myself mm. when I have disappointed others, disappointed myself. Mm. I'm very hard on myself. Type A, your average nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? Learning to forgive yourself is the most important so that you can move forward. At my church, the pastor says, one way to define sin is just the way we fall short of love. Oh my gosh, say that again? Sin is just the way that we fall short of love. And I think that's a more accurate way to describe it yes. and more matches up with what, you know, what God intends. I agree. I so agree. I love that. I'm gonna remember that in my head because it is all about love, isn't it? Yeah, we don't have these conversations all that much. Not anymore. And there's a way to talk about it, I think, in love and openness without judgment or some kind of, I don't know. Cutting think, off, Yeah. closing down the wall. And you know what it comes down to? We're all God's children. I know. Everybody gets in on it. It's, it's, I think if we thought about that more, yeah. it would be transforming. Then we really would be look at each other as brother and sister instead yes. of the enemy. In this family together. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what God wants us to do. Don't too, Savannah. Upon this rock. So on this day, Kristen Chenoweth, who God gave the voice of an angel, raised hers loud and strong, and we were blessed.
Blake Shelton is a country music legend. With 12 studio albums and 28 chart-topping hits throughout his three decades of making music. Most recently, he said goodbye to The Voice after being a coach for 23 seasons. Yes! Do you miss the big red chair? No. <laughs> I, don't, I tell people, you know, I don't miss the job at yeah. all. It was time yeah. to walk away, but I miss my family there. I mean, the, the, the crew and the cast and all the people behind the scenes it became my family. Yeah. You know, I've see, I literally was with these people more than I was with my actual family yeah. for years, you know? And so uh, to just all of a sudden never see them again is, is, is weird. We saw some of your time off on the ranch. What does that time off feel like? That's how I recharge myself. When you're on that hamster wheel, uh, it's just one of those things where you feel like one day you look up and you look back and 10 years has gone by and you go, what did I do with those last 10 years? Oh, I sat in that chair. And as incredible as that was, I mean, it changed my life. It changed my life in every way you can think of for the better. But there's also just the, the stuff that you just miss. And it's time for me to start living life now and just taking things in and slowing way down, not thinking, man, all right, I've got, I've got a, a day and eight hours to be home. I really need more free time to be able to spend it with all these other projects that I've got going and do it in a way that they don't run me down. You have a personal life to look forward to. Yeah. We saw some of that play out in the speech that you gave to Gwen when she was receiving her star in the Hollywood yeah. Walk of Fame. Congratulations to my all-time favorite songwriter on your star. You deserve this and I love you. What is the best part about your life now that she's in it? Oh my God. I mean, the best part is laying down with her at night and, and waking up and she's there in the morning. I just didn't know that that was out there, that that was possible for that feeling to be out there. You know, that kind of relationship, that kind of friendship, you know what I mean? It's just like, oh, uh, I thought I knew, but I didn't know, you know, and that's my fault. But uh, now that I do know, it is like, all right, now my life's starting. Now this is really where life starts for me, you know. Can we anticipate any more collabs between kids, you two? Children? <laughs> no, uh, kids. I actually was gonna say collaboration. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as long as I'm able to sing and record, I'm always gonna wanna record more with Gwen. I don't think either one of us wanna feel like we're overdoing it or, or, or turning it into that. But it's stupid not to pursue it a little bit, you know, because first of all, it's a lot of fun. Second of all, I, I, we've recorded four songs together. You make it feel like Christmas. And that may have been one of my biggest records I've ever been a part of. It comes back every year. Like, that's one of the most exciting <laughs> things that I've ever been a part of is to have a Christmas song that comes back every year. It's like, oh my God, we did that. How helpful is it that you two are able to kind of help each other brainstorm, help each other understand the music industry and grow in that way? It's a gift, I mean, to be able to have uh, Gwen to, to bounce ideas off of, to have someone to lean on and go, and what do you think about this? What would you tour? Would you tour there if you were me? Like, those are big, boring topics but they're really Im Im important things uh, and important steps to make. You know, timing is everything in the industry and to have someone who's just uh, has your best interest from the friend standpoint is incredible because uh, we've both pretty much seen it all and done it all at this point. Another role he takes seriously is stepfather to Gwen's three sons, Kingston, Zuma, and Apollo. I've had step parents. I think it's in some ways a, hard, a more difficult I try to be careful about, you know, when to step in and, and be smart about when to step back. But no matter what, always be there if I'm needed. I met Blake on the site of his latest venture, opening a sixth Old Red. This one right in the center of the Las Vegas Strip. I remember when we went to the opening of Old Red Nashville in 2018. Now, five years later, we're at the beginning of Old Red Las Vegas. Why did you decide to put down roots here? Believe it or not, at, at that grand opening in, in Nashville in 2018 was probably right about the time we started this project. I mean, that's how long uh, 
This has been in the works. Coming to Las Vegas is not something that you just decide to do and the next year you're there if you do it that way. Las Vegas was a part of the plan because for one thing, I know that there's a couple of country bars, I think, in Las Vegas and, and I've probably been to them. Uh, but there's nothing like there's nothing like this in Las Vegas. What we've been able to do here is combine uh, the country music uh, sound with that VIP experience yeah. that you can get in Las Vegas. For the country music family, the industry, Nashville, to have a home base now in Las Vegas, uh, it's obviously a big deal for me. You're bringing the biggest representation of Southern hospitality to Vegas. That's yeah. pretty iconic. It is, I, you know, and that's the one thing that I've always heard from people. Like when I'm in Las Vegas, like there's nowhere to go hear country music, you know. I think that has changed over the years. There's been a lot, uh, you know, of residencies and things. But as far as just a place to come have a beer and maybe step away from the gambling for a minute yeah. and go, all right, I'm actually going to get something in return for my money. I'm going to get a beer this time and hear some country music. Now there's a place in, in Las Vegas. It's, and the, it's, it's the Blake it's Shelton huge. twist. That's yeah. right. This place is huge. It I is mean, huge. we're sitting right here on the on the stage floor right now. Uh, there's actually a, a working basement underneath us, but there's one, two floors that actually look down on this stage, and then there's a rooftop area. Uh, every floor has a bar, and of course that uh, third floor up there has the VIP experience and, and the suites yeah. and stuff. It's so just we're incredible. where the performances are going to be. This is it. This is where. This I'm, is it. I'm telling you right now, when, when we do our grand opening, I want to be the one. Uh, that breaks in this stage because I think it's going to be here for a hundred years from now and I want to be the one who stepped on the stage for the first time. And Blake is stepping back onto stages across the country soon with a brand new tour kicking off in February. Well your album came out in 2021 and then last year you had a single Nobody and fans loved it not only because it was new but because you brought back the mullet. <laughs> So any other throwback styles you're going to bring out for this tour? I probably will, uh, I, but I don't know, probably if anything I bring back that's a throwback, it'll be some of my old records that I haven't sang in, in years, you know, I've just uh, been spending time lately listening to some of those old records trying to get ideas for the show and it's like, oh my God, I forgot about this song and this song was actually a hit in 2002, how come I don't do it anymore? So. I'll probably bring back a, a lot of that old school music that I just haven't done uh, in in a lot of years because I've been on a hamster wheel for so long. I think it'd be a blast to dig out some of that old stuff. So it'll be a best of Blake Shelton tour. I guess so. Yeah. That's fun. The best I can do of Blake <laughs> Shelton. You're bringing Emily Ann Roberts on tour with you. She yeah. was on season nine on Team Blake. Why is that so important to you? When she was on, on The Voice, uh, I remember uh, I was standing there off to the side with my manager watching her rehearse and I told my manager, I said, hey, you ought to manage her. I mean, look at her. She's super talented. She's got so much charisma. She's beautiful. Like, that's a star standing there. And he goes, well, I'll talk to her. Seven or eight years later, he's been her manager all this time and it's just now to a point where she's released a, a record and, and is ready to go out on tour. And of course, if she would have gone out on tour with anybody else, I would have been like, what the hell? Yeah. What about your old coach here, you know? So the fact that I get to bring her out and put her out on, you know, in these cities and uh, on the big stage is, is a, I love that. I, I love to be the one that, that uh, uh, gets to introduce her to, you know, a whole new live audience out there. Any new music we can expect? I never really stop recording. It's, it's just something that I do sporadically. I'll call Scott Hendrix, my producer, or he'll reach out to me and go, Hey man, let's just go cut these two songs that we've been thinking about and just get them done. They're, they'll be done when it's time, you know. And before I know it, which is where I'm at right now, I'll have eight or ten things recorded and, and, and something that looks like an album, you know. And so I would say just based off of history and knowing how I've worked in the past, let's probably have some new music uh, in 2024.
If that isn't enough, he's also got season two of his USA Network show along with his buddy Carson Daly called Barmageddon. It pits two celebrities against each other in classic bar games with a twist. My new favorite game is called Fool's Ball. And the first time we ever played the game was actually with Kelly Clarkson and Michelle Rodriguez. And people were getting hit. If you see it happen to someone, it's entertainment. So Blake challenged me to a game called Wheel of Redemption. So if you lose, you get to spin the wheel. And this season, we finally had some people say, you know what, I'm just not doing it. I would rather lose because they've tasted the first one and it was so horrifying. All right, here we go. You started this whole thing, literally. Take oh, me out to the ball God. game. So take me out to the ball game is non-alcoholic beer, a little cocktail weenie, squirt of ketchup and mustard. You're really um, generous with those squirts. Well, listen, here at Barmageddon, we don't like to skim. Is that a raw hot dog? No. Bottoms up. <laughs> Whether it's games or music, Blake is all about folks having a good time. When customers come into an Old Red, what do you want them to feel leaving it? I want them to, to leave having found a new favorite artist every time, you know? I want them to realize that we're putting talent in these places that could be the next big thing. As you see a lot of these new artists coming up uh, in the next five, ten years, a lot of them are, have tell you that they cut their teeth at Old Red Nashville or Gatlinburg or Orlando. There's already been a lot of people that's come out recently that kind of got their start playing the old red there in Nashville and so I think that it's just going to continue to, to grow and maybe it'll be a place where you hop from one venue to the next, the, the next step in stone. It's amazing because throughout everything we've talked about, mentorship has been the key line throughout that kind of leads your passion and I think it's really, it's awesome that that's your dream and that you're living it out. It's the new voice, it's the new residency, it's the new old red. Yeah. So come on down. I will. To Old Red Las Vegas. <laughs>for doing this john my pleasure thanks for having me back great to see you i think the last time we did it we were zooming we were zooming during the uh, pandemic that was bigger love a couple yes, years back bigger love and now we're here in person in new york it's great to be here i can't believe it's been that long what does album day feel like you've put so much into this years and years of writing and work and everything and now the world has it i'm truly excited i, I think it's similar to being a kid on christmas where you're like anticipating and waiting for you know what you hope will be a really good day I want them to love it, and I want to feel like that joy that there's a connection between mm -hmm. what I created and what people feel from what I created. So I'm excited to have that feeling. And you were such a creative. I can only imagine you pent up at home the last couple of years just writing songs and putting yeah, music to well, it. Yeah, well, that was the uh, good side of not being able to tour. So we had time to write a lot. That's why I ended up making the double album. I was just so creative and productive and prolific during this time that a lot of material to choose from. 
And this is a very narrowed down version of what we wrote because we wrote about 80 or 90 songs. Did you and, really? Uh, we've put out 24 of them. Wow. So yeah, we were so productive and wrote so much during that time. And uh, I've been waiting to, to give it to the world. With a name like Legend, there's a lot to live up to. The album is called? It's called Legend. Legend. Yes. We're finally just saying it. Yeah. We're finally going there. Well, I figured it's my way of, of making a self-titled album. I put so much of myself into it. It's kind of wide-ranging. It's a double album. It really is a confluence of all my different influences and inspirations. And I was like, this is me. This is a full version of who I am in my life right now. And I'm just going to call it Legend. Have you resisted that in the past? I don't think your name's been in an I album never thought to do it before. And, you know, I haven't used it in a bunch of titles, but, you know, every headline writer is like, you know, it's, it's too tempting not to use it. <laughs> legend in the making, living legend, uh, legend by name, legend by nature, as they say in the UK. So people have used it many times, but I've never really used it as a title until right now. I think people watching should know, you did not anoint yourself, I John did not. Legend. I did not. This was from guys in the studio yes. like 20 years ago. Yeah, right? like 20 years ago, the first guy to call me that was a, a spoken word artist named Jay Ivey. And uh, he's from Chicago and I met him when we were working on Kanye's college dropout together. And he started calling me that and it kind of evolved into a stage name. And I was hesitant to take it on as a stage name because come on, I didn't have a record deal yet. <laughs> How could I call myself a legend? And then, you know, I was like, I'm going to take this on because I'm not gonna go into my career with this fear that it's not gonna work out. I'm gonna go into it with this belief that I'm gonna make it work and I'm gonna try to live up to this name. And that's what I've been trying to do for a couple decades now. Honey. Honey makes the world go round. World go round. So when you sit down, John, to do an album, uh -huh. is it different every time? Bigger Love, maybe you had one sort of theme in mind and this time something different? Well, part of the choices I make beforehand are like who I want to work with. Sometimes it's a little more free flowing and you know, you never know who you're going to end up in the room with. But a lot of it's planned out at first, but you don't know what that collaboration is going to create. You just kind of you know people that you like and that you might be interested in working with. Sometimes it's people you work with before. Sometimes you want to spice things up and change things up. This is the first time it was executive produced by Ryan Tedder. Yeah. I had written with him before, but we had never done this much work together. And it was so much fun working with him. And then we brought in all kinds of amazing creatives, amazing co-writers, amazing producers, amazing guest vocalists. And it just evolves as you go. And you try something and it might not work. And then you try something else might not work, but when you hit things that really work and they land, and you're like, I want to do more of that, and it just starts to build. And eventually, you've got, a, you've got an album. You come out hot with Rick, Rick Ross. Ross. Rick Ross on track one, and I've collaborated with him more on duets than any other artist. We've done a bunch on his albums. We've done two on my albums, and then we've done a few with DJ Khaled and, and French Montana and various other artists. So we work well together. His voice and my voice, the kind of beats we like to do together, it really works well. But we've also got Jasmine Sullivan, Jid, Saweetie, Janae Aiko, Ty Dolla Sign, Lettucey, Rhapsody, just some really talented, amazing people, and a lot of people behind the scenes that aren't featured as well. So you got down to 24 songs from yes. 80 or 90, you yeah. said. When you write 90 songs, how do you even decide what the 24 are going to be, and will the other ones end up somewhere? Someday? Well. When I've made albums in the past, I've usually written like 40 or 50 at least for a, a single album. So for this double album, we wrote a bit more. But yeah, there's a bunch of tracks that may never get heard. I don't know. Maybe they'll release them after I die like Tupac. I don't know. <laughs> but I like to write a lot and I like to collaborate a lot. And then I try to really focus in on which songs really move me, the ones that feel necessary, the ones that I feel like will move other people. I try to make it so there's no filler. You know, that's a matter of opinion. But uh, I, I think I made Legend with no filler. Yes, no skips. No skips. Listen to it right through. <laughs> Yeah.
sit down to write a song, what is the process like for you? At the piano first, or you with a pen in your hand first? Sometimes, so sometimes I'm at the piano first. Usually the music comes first. Okay. And usually I'm either writing by myself or writing with two or three other people. And we'll start and figure out some music. We might, we might figure out a groove, a beat. And the next thing I do is I'll start mumbling things that don't make sense into the mic. So I call it a mumble track, but it's a melody and a rhythm, but no lyric yet. So mm. for ordinary people, it's just, so I'll start a song like that. It'll sound like nonsense, but it'll have a melody. And it, you'll recognize the melody later when the song is done. And I have recordings of all the mumbles that I've done <laughs> for new songs. And, that's your next uh, album. <laughs> that's my the next mumbles. album, Just Mumbling. <laughs> um, but yeah, so every song starts like that. And then eventually I figure out what the theme of the song is, what it feels like, what emotion I'm, I'm exploring, and then build the lyric around that. When you do an album, do you think, okay, my first album was this, my next one was this, this is your eighth studio album. Yeah. Do you think of it as a big sort of spectrum of your work or do you just say, I want to put out the best music this time I can? I, I start just thinking, I want to make great music yeah. and I want this to be better than what I did last time. Mm. Um, and honestly, I want every album to be the best album. When, when I'm working on Legend, I'm thinking, this has got to be my best album ever. And I go into every project like that and I go into it thinking I have to prove myself every time too because I don't feel like I've, I'm guaranteed success. I don't feel like I'm guaranteed that people will love it. Mm -hmm. So I go into it thinking I have to prove to them that it's worthy of their attention, worthy of their love and worthy of them coming back to it. And so that's, that's my motivation every time. Listening to the album and looking at the track list, mm -hmm. some of the artists aren't household names that mm -hmm. you collaborate with. They're yeah. incredibly talented. Yeah. And I thought, in some of these cases, this is John lifting up someone. He sees sure. promise in the way you were lifted up when you were young. Absolutely, and, and artists did that for me at the beginning of my career, and it meant a lot to me. And I think I also like working with newer artists because they have a way of helping you refresh yourself and keeping you uh, connected to what's next, uh, rather than just kind of stuck with where you were before. And you know, I'm in my 40s now, I've been making records for two decades, and I think it's good for me to bring new energy into my life, into my creative process. Does Chrissy have a favorite song on the new album? I'm not sure which one it is, but I think it's Stardust. She's had a long time with that song, and it was as we were going through a really tough period in our family. Um, we had lost a baby recently, and uh, it was just a tough time for us. You are made of stardust. The And that song was very healing and very inspiring for her and for us as a family. And uh, I think that will always be her favorite. So it's not the song that you wrote for her about the well, way that, you have grown. Well, that's not the only one I wrote for her. I just <laughs> happened to bring that one up recently, but uh, we've got a few. But yes, that one too. She likes that one That's too. a beautiful song. It was called Splash. <laughs> yes. It's a sexy song. <laughs> A lot of my songs are about sex. Though. A few of them. They are. They are. But some about love. Yes, about love. Some and, of them about commitment. Some of them are about going through challenges together. The gamut of what it means to be in a relationship with somebody that's deep and lasting. Well, that's the, the song I was thinking of, which is where it's sort of this, this title is sort of a twist. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is we're growing differently together. And the more we grow, the more I actually fall in love with you. Yeah, the song's called I Don't Love You Like I Used To. And when Chrissy heard the title, she was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you writing a breakup song? <laughs> but it's the opposite of a breakup song. When you are in a long relationship, when you go through challenges together, when you see all the different sides of that person, you actually can grow to love them more because it's been fortified by more real life, you know? It's not just the uh, original infatuation, the original lust, the original attraction that you had for that person. It's so much more than that. And that's what the song's about. I think it's a good like anniversary song. Absolutely. For people, because as, as, as you grow and your commitment deepens with somebody, you have kids together, all these things, uh, your love grows too. That's true. Yeah. In August, the couple announced the happy news that Chrissy is pregnant again. How are you feeling about number three? Oh, we're excited. You know, it's always a bit of cautious optimism, especially when you've lost one before. We really feel excited. We're looking forward to this new joy in our lives. Our kids are excited too. Especially given where you guys have come in the last couple of mm -hmm. years, this must feel all the sweeter. Yeah, it feels really good and it feels like 
We learned so much over the years through struggle and through the challenges that we've faced. And I think we've both grown so much. Chrissy especially has grown a lot in the past few years. We're ready. We're ready for a new baby in our lives. You know what they say about number three? Now you go to a zone defense. Zone defense. You can't go man-to-man. No more one-on-one. -on -one. You got a head on a swivel. <laughs> You're going to lose one of them once in a while, and that's exactly. okay. Exactly. That's okay. Legend's day job allows him to be home in Los Angeles with his growing family. He just began his seventh season as a coach on The Voice. How great a gig is that, be honest? It, honestly, it's a great gig. What I love about it is one, I live in Los Angeles and getting to film in Los Angeles instead of being on the road so much is really nice as a family man, being close to my kids, being able to take them to school before I go to work, all of that is great. And I genuinely love working with our artists. They're inspiring, they're hungry, they have so much to offer the world and you just wanna help them be the best artist they can be. And that opportunity is so much fun. And my fellow coaches are a lot of fun, too. Right. They make me laugh. We have a good time together. It's a good group. Yes. It's a good group. But after two years off the road during the pandemic, Legend was craving a live audience of his own. In April, he began a Las Vegas residency. Now, you've already had the chance to play some of these songs live in yes. Vegas. I just love seeing the reaction when people hear the new songs and they see them live without having heard them on a record yet. And uh, it's been a lot of fun kind of market testing them in Vegas. Yes. And which of those are the crowd pleasers? Well, all she want to do is like, yeah. the, it's, it's the best one live. All she want to do, do is dance. I want to do is get up. Got me in the palm of a hand energy just elevates in the room. Everybody gets up and starts dancing. And for a song to do that well without anyone even knowing it when I'm playing it, uh, it's pretty amazing. You've been home writing songs, as you said, for a couple of years. What was it like to get out in front of that crowd again in Vegas and just feel that energy back finally? Well, my Vegas show is like no other show I've done before. We have dancers, we have feathers, we have the <laughs> full Vegas glitz and glamour, but we also really wanted to take care to explore my entire career, my entire journey, my entire story. So it's a really autobiographical show. With that autobiographical piece of it, mm -hmm. when was the first moment, John, when somebody said, whew, this guy can sing? Do you remember what age that was? Was it in church? I was, was it in later? church. I was probably seven or eight. I was singing in the church choir. I had begged my mother and my grandmother to let me sing in the church choir. They were in charge. My mom directed the choir. My grandmother yeah. played the organ. And so they were in charge of the choir, but I was a little too young to be in the choir for a while, but I kept begging and I'd be at rehearsal all the time with my mom. So uh, eventually uh, they let me join. And probably by the time I was eight or nine, I got a solo in the choir and I, I felt like I was on top of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and when you feel that energy from the crowd, it's very addictive. Uh, you want it again. And I think that's why I'm here today is because I enjoyed that feeling that I felt uh, early on and I wanted to keep feeling it. So from that moment, did you think I'm going to be a professional musician? Was it oh, conceivable to you that, that was a job? It was, but I had no idea what that entailed. Right. Uh, you know, I, I would watch Star Search, I would watch the Grammys, <laughs> and I would see, you know, these young artists on Star Search, you know, auditioning and, and competing. And I was like, I could do that. And then I would watch the Grammys and that would be the pinnacle. You'd see, you know, Michael or Stevie or Luther and you'd be like, I want to be up there where they are. I always wanted that, and I had no idea what it would take, but I just kept making music. I was taking piano lessons, singing in the church choir, singing at school. Whenever somebody would give me the mic, I would find a way to sing. It must be crazy for you to be in an arena or in Vegas with a sold-out crowd and think, I was nine years old singing in a church. Yeah. How did I get here? Yeah, so in the middle of my show, I usually tell a story about, you know, the fact that this is my dream come true. I'm living my dream, and I feel so grateful and every time I'm on that stage, I don't take it for granted. I get to do what I love to do every single day. I get to write songs and perform them for people. I get to feel that connection with the audience, feel their energy. It's amazing.
lot of people talk about your break is coming with Kanye, mm -hmm. but I was going back reading and I didn't realize you played piano on Everything is Everything. Yes. Yeah, so with that Lauren was Hill, my first. you're still in college. Yeah, so Lauren Hill, she's making The Miseducation of Lauren Hill in 1998. I was a junior in college and I, on the weekends, would drive up from Philadelphia to Scranton and I was working at a church there. I would direct the choir and I would play um, keyboard for the church. And one of my choir members grew up with Lauren Hill. She would drive back and forth to Jersey sometimes to work on the album with her. And she invited me to go with her one time. And eventually my friend says, Johnny, why don't you play a couple songs for Lauren? She should hear what you can do. So I sit at the piano, play a couple songs. And then Miss Hill says, why don't you play on this song we're working on right now? I played on the song and it was Everything is Everything. Wow. And that was the first time I was ever part of a major record. So I didn't know that the song was gonna make the album. I didn't know that my part was going to make the song, but in the late summer, as the album was about to come out, Lauren's A&R person calls me up and asks me how to spell my name for the credits. And so I'm like, okay, I'm on the album. And then I go back to school and tell everybody I'm on track 13 of, <laughs> of, of their favorite album, which everyone was playing. Yes. It was in every dorm room, every apartment. Everybody was playing it and uh, I was a part of it. Little did you know it was going to become an iconic album. Yeah. You were there just trying out songs. And I eventually got signed to that same label that called me up uh, to ask for my, the spelling of my name. I wow. signed to Columbia as my record deal when I, when I first got signed. You never know where that break's going to come from, do Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Same goes with, with Kanye, I know. Yeah. Kanye was not yet Kanye West. He was not when very you met famous him. at the time. He was just starting to bubble up as a producer. And he was living in Chicago, but then he moved to the New York area. And I was roommates with his cousin. And uh, his cousin Devon and I went to Penn together. We were roommates in New York together. And Devon says, uh, I've got a cousin moving here from Chicago. He just started working with Rockefeller. He's a really good producer. He's also rapping as well. So, you know, you should meet up, connect, work together. So we invited him to my show at uh, Jimmy's Uptown in Harlem. And um, I played the show and then I met Kanye after the show. And eventually, a few months later, we started writing together. He would help me with my demo, which eventually became Get Lifted. And then I would sing and play keys and write with him on his demo, which eventually became The College Dropout. It's so cool to think about. Kanye is living in an apartment in Newark. Yes. Just writing songs. There was yes. that documentary that shows him working yes. out, Jesus Walks. Absolutely. And, and, and so all I was that. going in there to write with him and sing with him. And then he was helping me work on my new music too. And then eventually I signed with his production company, Good Music. And we made Get Lifted together and a bunch of other albums after that. And man, you started off with a bang. Your first album yeah. gets eight Grammy nominations, wins three of them. Yes. What was that moment like for you? Because album one, you're here, you've arrived. It was surreal. And you know, I didn't have any expectations that it was going to do that well. But that year leading up to it, we started to see more and more growth. The album came out, it wasn't a huge hit at the beginning, but Ordinary People started to really blow up and that was the signature song from the album and it really connected with a lot of people. And by uh, the time the Grammy nominations were happening, it's the end of that year where the album's been out for nearly a year. And early December, I show up at the nominations and find out I have eight nominations. And I'm tied with Mariah on her uh, Emancipation, which was like her yeah. big comeback album, and Kanye on his second album. And we all have eight nominations, and I'm nominated for Best New Artist and Best R&B Album and a few other awards, and uh, it was surreal, truly surreal, truly like all my dreams were coming true. And it really just set me up for the rest of my career because once you get that Best New Artist and you get that Grammy you know, seal of approval, it kind of opens more doors and makes more things possible. And I've been uh, trying to make the most of it since mm -hmm. then. You've also spoken so much about our society mm -hmm. and justice and all those themes mm -hmm. that are important to you in music and outside of music. How crucial is that to you to sort of be a voice for those things, especially in this time? Well, I've always thought that that's what it meant to be an artist because a lot of my favorite artists over the years, they not only would write songs or perform songs that were inspirations for a movement, but they would also behind the scenes be funding protests, funding organizations who are fighting for justice. And I just always believed that part of my role as an artist, particularly a black artist in America, I always feel like we have a responsibility to not just rest on our laurels, not just be in it for our own success and our own money, but to look 
out for our people and speak out on behalf of justice and equality, America achieving the ideals that we've established as our ideals as a country that we've yet to reach, but I want to I, I want to advocate for us getting there. Mm. What do you think music can do to that end? I'm thinking about a song like Glory, which mm -hmm. number one is a great song, so it draws you in, but then the message gets through to people while they're tapping their feet. Well, I'm never sure how impactful a song is because I think there's so much more that goes into change. It's organizing, yeah. it's getting people's attention in the right way, it's, it's uh, using whatever moral persuasion you can use to get people to come to your side of thinking. But I think music, one, is inspired by the movement, inspired by people out there being activists. Um, when we wrote Glory, we were writing it inspired by Dr. King, but we were also writing it inspired by the people who were protesting in Ferguson at yeah. that time. And so we included lyrics that alluded to both time periods. And once we wrote the song, having been inspired by those activists, then we saw people turn around and march with our song. And so it's a kind of a perfect illustration of how that feedback loop keeps going between the artist community and the activist community. We're inspired by them, they're inspired by us, and it keeps it going. And it's a constant struggle. Is yeah. it? In our culture, it's maybe yeah. two steps forward, one step back. There's always um, been a backlash, whether it was Civil War and Reconstruction, you saw the backlash to that, mm -hmm. and Jim Crow kind of uh, lasted for decades as a backlash to the advances that we made right after the Civil War. So America's history has been progress and backlash, and all that means is that we can't rest. We have to keep fighting mm -hmm. and keep pushing toward a more perfect union and a more just country. What gives you hope, John, for America right now? Well, I think we have to celebrate all of our wins. Each time we uh, are able to accomplish something, um, a lot of times my organization, Free America, is fighting for legislative change, like we fought for Amendment 4 in Florida. And that re-enfranchised like a million people in the state. And when you have a victory like that, it's good to celebrate it. It's good to celebrate these wins. And I think those wins are the fuel that we need for more hope, to keep fighting, for more change, and to achieve the goals that we really want. And I think you need that progress to, to fill that hope, and that hope is the fuel you need to keep going. Does it feel good to you, John, that at a wedding somewhere this weekend, somebody's <laughs> going to be playing their song? Yes. You're playing your song and have their first dance to that, or people, yes. they love each other because of the music you put on. Does that yeah, feel good? Yeah, and it's cool because now, because of social media, we're able to see it because they usually will post a video yeah. from their wedding. And so I've been seeing people dancing to All of Me and Stay With You and So High throughout all these years. And now we've got a few more songs that I think might be good wedding songs too. So I always love being a part of people's celebrations and it means a lot to me that they would include me because you know we sit in these rooms and, and create these songs and you never know what's gonna happen with them. But when you find out that they mean that much to so many people, it's a beautiful thing. I interviewed Ed Sheeran a couple of months ago mm -hmm. and he said, I'm starting to think people only invite me to weddings so I'll get up and oh, sing. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You too? Oh yeah, <laughs> for years. <laughs> my, my, 
my, uh, my sense is, you know, if I'm going to someone's wedding, it's because I really care about them and want to be there for them. So a lot of times I will end up singing if, if, if I'm rested and, and I'm not too drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but you but, know it's coming. You can see it coming, right? They want you to get on the piano. I was like, oh, it just happens to be a piano over here. <laughs> Magical. Who knew? What a coincidence. Before I let you go, John, I'm, I'm lining up all the things you do and wondering how you do them. I'm looking at, you're going to go out and tour, you got the Vegas residency, you've got the voice, the new album, you're going to be out promoting it. How do you sort of allocate your time? Because you're there with your kids, you're there with Chrissy. How do you put it all together? Honestly, most of my life is still focused on writing songs and performing. During this couple of weeks, I'm going to do a lot of promotion and a lot of interviews, but I try to focus really on the art, on the creativity, and on my family. And those are my main focuses. Congratulations on the album. People Thank are going to love it. It's so good to see you, man. Great to see you, Willie. Thanks, John. Thank you. She wanna do it. so much for doing this. Oh my God, thanks for Great having to me. See you. When you walk into a studio like this, mm -hmm. is it hard for you like not to sit at the piano or not to pick up the guitar? <laughs> yeah, my eyes are just darting around <laughs> at figured. all the possibilities. <laughs> when did music come into your life? I guess, how did music come into your life? Well, you know, my family always did music and my uh, grandfather, Grandpa Vernon, he was like a country yodeler. And um, we all loved him so much and he got ALS. And he died really young at 50. Hmm. And my parents were young parents. And so I just, with all of that was really um, vivid. And the loss of his voice, I remember being a paramount turning point for my mother, who was also a country singer. I feel the way she coped with her grief was to dive into singing. He always wanted her to do it. And she's painfully shy about it. And so she, you know, took a little bit of the money that he left and bought a PA system and started like a bar band and auditioned out at a community theater and involved me because I was so interested and I was only eight maybe at the time. So I got up on stage for the first time in a community theater called the Northwest Grand Old Opry at about eight and started singing and that became what the Carlisles did. And so it had a weight to it. It was really sacred to our family and I still love country music to this day, classic country music, because I feel like it, you know, it raised us and got us through such a traumatic time for mm. our mom. And um, all I could think about was being famous, getting on stage, is that right? hearing applause. Oh, yeah. yeah. From eight years old, basically. Yeah. This is what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it was never just music for the love of music. It was music for the love of people. At what point did someone in your life say, hmm, her voice is special? <laughs> There's something extraordinary about what's coming out of her mouth. Someone say that to you at any point, or did you realize that I can really belt it? I think I thought I was special long before I was <laughs> special. <laughs> <laughs> you had that swagger. I remember, oh, singing in the dentist's office, singing on the bus, singing, just singing for anybody that would listen and feeling really special and not being, you know. Um, but wa wa just wanting to be, really, really wanting to be. And um, just eventually started to like study it mm. and take it really, really seriously so that I could get to where I wanted to get to. And I see it, I see it in other young people too, the audacity, mm. the American exceptionalism. <laughs> <laughs> it's embarrassing, but it, it, it can sometimes lead to a really beautiful life. It's not bad to have a little confidence, even no. if you haven't earned it yet, right? No, no. Yeah. And sometimes for kids, like, it was all I had, you know? Yeah. And for, for kids like me, I recommend a little bit of audacity. If I went back and listened to you singing as a teenager, say, would I hear any of the voice I hear on stage no. today? None of that. Uh-uh. <laughs> totally different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You'd hear no, um, like, power or drama or technique or any of the things that I really thrive on right now. I mean, I feel like... Right around the time I was um, 13 or 14, my love for Elton John and just honestly the gay 90s and the drama therein had 
formed to a point where I was wanting to sing like Freddie Mercury and there was I wanted to have some glamorousness in my life vocally and, mm. and some elegance and so I started to sort of um, dream of of doing that you know did they give you some sort of beacon as a young gay woman living yeah. in rural Washington like yeah and being raised on country music and being such a, a Gemini scallywag trailer park country girl and then there here's this elegance and this elegance is really intertwined with queerness in a way that I couldn't even articulate, but I just knew I, wa I just wanted it. I wanted parts of it, you know. But I wanted to retain the rugged right. authenticity of, of who I am, too. And I, I hope that I'm achieving that and that I'm, you know, setting myself up to honor both of these weirdos. <laughs> well, you're, you're doing that and then some. Um, so then as you move on, you do start to find that voice that I might recognize a little bit better. You put out your first album in 2005, but you'd been, you'd had some success before that. You, people were noticing you. Do you remember when you felt like you'd made it, so to speak? The entire time. <laughs> if You're... I won a karaoke contest, if I was busking and there were 30 people when I opened my eyes, the entire time. It was, it was actually ridiculous. It could have been quite a miss. <laughs> Where does that come from? Where did that confidence come from? I don't know. I don't know, but it's like everybody always talks to me about, well, you've worked so hard at it. You know, you've worked so hard, you've worked so hard. And I'm like, I did? You know, I don't, I don't know if it really feels like that. When you really, really love it, you, all, you kind of tend to feel successful even in really hard times. Mm. And even rejection just feels like a fluke. Right. You know? Right. They don't get it. Yeah. But I think that the moments that really stand out in my mind as like, oh my God, like this has happened, are the ones that like involve my heroes. Mm. Like getting to sing with Elton or, you know, j watching Joni come back to Newport in the way that, that she just did. Those are the moments where I really realize that I've made it in a way that is a part of history and not just a part of me enjoying my life, which I do. I love this. You're like, you can ask a hundred different ways, but I always knew this was going to happen. <laughs> Even when it probably wasn't going to happen. <laughs> it's so good, though. It's so good. But I think it's fair to say, let's take the story, for example. Yeah. That was a breakthrough moment, wasn't mm -hmm. it? A very popular song gets picked up in a commercial, runs during the Olympics. Yeah. Everyone goes, ooh, what's that song? Who mm -hmm. sings that? Was that a, a milestone, at least, in your career? Yeah, and the story was like, it took a, a 10 years for it to really have, you know, impacted in such a way that like would be like considered a hit, you know, because mm. I've never had one, not, not on radio, not, not in life, you know. And so I've been able to make sort of the trajectory of my career or my catalog like the, the hit as it, as it were. So I get to pick the songs I want to play on stage and all that stuff. But every night I sing the story because there's that note, you know, there's yeah. that moment of total triumph. There's that Freddie Mercury moment yeah. that I just can't do without. Yeah. I'll give you another moment. The Grammys, 2019. Oh, yeah. The performance is so good, but the message of the song resonates with anybody who's thinking about themselves or their kids or somebody they love. But also to me, it was just like a woman who had her moment. Mm -hmm. This is it. Mm -hmm. Let's see how you do it. Mm -hmm. And just blew the roof off the place. How great did you feel after that night? Everything changed after that. I mean, the shows got bigger. You know, the audiences got bigger. We started to make a little bit of money. Um, I, uh, people called me, you know, cool people and famous people and I got to, I got to start hanging out in circles that I was just reading about and a lot just changed. I just feel, I felt like, you know, I was looking at, at 40 and that I had made it, made it.
Has it been fun, Brandy, to get back out in front of crowds and to do all the things you did before the pandemic and just feel that energy and feel music again? I know it's been great to go to shows. How's it been for you out on tour? It's been so much fun. I mean, I didn't realize I've been thriving on it, you know, so completely since I was like eight years old. And, and I thought it made me who I was, you know? So in, in, on some level, it was good to know that um, when it went away that I actually still existed, <laughs> you know, in some other dimension. But it's uh, really beautiful to be back doing what I feel like I was meant to do again and just connecting with people. I need people. Yeah, I mean, you, and you spent the time during the pandemic making music, yeah. making your, your album. What was that time like for you? Well, you know, we all live together. Um, my wife and I and our kids and our band, you know, we're trying to navigate school and being parents together. And it's interesting, it's like they say that it takes you your, your whole life to write your first album. And then your second one you have to do it in about five and a half minutes. Right. And so that first album is always about coming of age and love and loss and heartbreak for the first time. And, you know, that you're lucky if you still have your parents. And then the second album is about touring. And no one can really relate to it until you're sort of Saturn return and you start approaching later in life. But there's a predictable trajectory and what artists had during the pandemic was they had a new thing to write about that mm. the world as we know it hadn't experienced yet. And so I was fascinated by what do we learn, what did we learn about ourselves in this time? Because mm. we learned new things. And, um, you know, there was a lot of conversation about it. We've got this place in the woods that we all go down to every day at five o'clock and drink and try out conspiracy theories on one another and <laughs> all that stuff made its way into the album yeah yeah people think you're joking this is how you live you live well, on, a, you on a compound yeah. mm -hmm. no, I'm with not joking. family bandmates kids animals all kinds of stuff oh yeah what is that scene like on a typical day <sighs> i mean it's 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 there we can't see each other's houses we just sort of get to each other's houses on four wheelers and stuff mm. um but we always know that we're there for each other we've been a band for 22 years writing songs together, living and dying and fighting and going through rehab and just being, you know, each, in each other's extended families as well. Mm. It's fascinating because we write about each other. Mm. And so I know when a song's been written about me and I have to sing it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or I know um, that they've written about something difficult that's happened in their family and just from pure empathy, I can barely sing the words without, without crying. Mm. And um, the fabric of that relationship, it makes, I think, our writing prolific, but authentic, because I'm not, I'm not interpreting, I'm in the story. On the, in these silent days, you've got songs about motherhood, you've got songs about being married, you've got songs about your faith mm -hmm. and that journey you've been on. You've written and sung about those, those themes before, but did you get a new perspective on some of those, those ideas that made it onto the album? Yeah, well, it's like, like I was saying, it was such a magnifying glass, you know what I mean? And also during that time, I had written a book. Yeah. And that's crazy. When you go to mine, mine your life and emotional trajectory chronologically like that, and it plays out in a linear way. And until you actually sit down to write it into something like a book, you're not remembering those things. Mm. And um, yeah, it made me want to write 10 albums. The book, which was a number one bestseller immediately, by the way, which you point <laughs> out, that must have been crazy just to think, I'm going to sit down, write through my life. I'll put it out in the world. We'll see what happens. What was it like to have it just explode the way it did? Man, I'm so proud of it because, I mean, for so many reasons. I think one of the main reasons is that because I didn't, because I dropped out of high school so young. Um, I, and I have like diploma nightmares all the time where I'm like in school and I don't have my pants on and I need credits and I'm not going to graduate and I'm like 35. Um, you know, I think that having that book come out and do that well made me feel like in some ways like I finished something hmm. unfinished that had always sort of plagued me. It's like I've always really worried about whether or not I am fit to sit here and do these interviews and to express myself this way. And the book, you know, y you can teach an old dog new tricks. Like it really changed my outlook on myself um, at this point in my life. What was that journey like for you to sit down and say, all right, whew, here we go. Here's my life. Well, it was so effortless, it just flew out of me. So it came out of me so fast. I basically had written the book in like five weeks. Hmm. And I thought a book was like this like thing was gonna take me a long time. I had like two years planned, you know, to work on it and it just poured out of me. And then I had to go back and look back at it and the things I was realizing 
about myself were the things I didn't necessarily love. Like I think a lot of things are funny that are not funny. Mm. I'm quick to anger. I'm quick to judgment. I'm quick to to um, to things that I didn't think I was quick to. And I'm reading my own words, and I'm like, did I say that? Do mm. I think that's funny? How mm. am I going to feel when so and so reads that? So there were a lot of of um, conversations after the fact that did not go well for me and grew me up. Hmm. People who read the book yeah. and kind of challenged you on some of those things? Sure, yeah. And then I had some conversations where I had to set a healthy boundary and hold my own and say, well, actually, this is my story to tell, mm -hmm. you know, too. And so it's a very complicated line when you do this job and you become a public person because the people in your life, if you're lucky enough to have them alive, no matter what your past is, they didn't sign up to be a public right. person. Right. So what do you do? Right. I'm glad I didn't overthink it because <laughs> now I don't know if I could do it again. So we talked about some of the songs on Silent Days, and now we've got this, I guess you call it, you'll describe it better than I do, but sort of the stripped down version of the album, The Canyon Haze. Mm -hmm. What's different about this version than what we heard last fall when, when it came out? Well, it's, everything's different. It's almost like the upside down of it, mm. you know, with the ethos being to kind of conjure the sunsets and the Southern California folklore and the beauty and the lushness and the harmonies of the Laurel Canyon um, scene. And so it's kind of cool because anything on the album that was up-tempo is like now a ballad and vice uh, versa. And if it was on yeah. piano, now it's on guitar. If it was stripped down and just me alone, now it's like five-part harmony with mamas and papas call and answer beautiful things. And it was just honestly um, a joy. It was a lot of work to create it, but it was a joy. It's truly beautiful. People are going to love it, and they're going to love that there's some David Bowie on there. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> wow, where did that come from? That's amazing. We were recording the song for a movie, and towards the end of uh, In the Canyon Haze, I was like, this is a project that I love, but this is not really the direction I'm going in as an artist, but it's just, it's this... It's sequestered off. It's its own island, you know? Mm. So I started feeling like, I don't want people to think this is like what I'm going to do next, you know? <laughs> so I wanted to just like throw that David Bowie song on there at the end and be like, just kidding. <laughs> Glam rock. Oh my God, it's such a nice gem <laughs> dropped in there. Is that fun to sing a song like Space Oddity? Oh my God, it's deliriously fun. It's like wildly exciting. I've been doing it live every night oh. and it's just oh, unapologetic drama. I also love the high women, what you did with that. And it gets to something you were talking about before, which is 
lifting the profile of women, not just in country music, but, but in music broadly. It's a tribute, obviously, to the, the highwaymen of, of yeah. yore. Yeah. Um, what was the, the idea behind that? Why was that so important to you to put that group together? I mean, that the group of, of the highwaymen has just become so much more than the band. It's just, it's a conversation, it's a movement, and it's evolving to this day, you know, to shine a light on the people that country music um, leaves behind frankly you know so many of us live this these rural lifestyles and we love these themes of, of family and values and faith and you know living on the land and working with your hands and these things are ubiquitous they're for people of color they're for they're for LGBTQIA plus people too and country music tends to really acknowledge only one kind of person and since country music raised me and it was the only thing for a really long time in my life that I was given access to those themes of only one kind of person, they didn't help. They didn't help me when mm. I reached my adolescence and I needed to see myself mm. in the music that I loved. And I found it where I needed to find it. But um, even when I was young, I didn't have much to complain about because we had so many more uh, diverse country singers then than we do now and that's jarring is progress moving backward which I think we're seeing so much more than we want to see and why is that why do you think that is in the world of country music because you're right you think about Tanya Tucker and Loretta and Dolly and all the people that you've worked with mm -hmm. you don't see as much of that today do you you really don't no and even like 80s and 90s country you know everything from Trisha and Faith and yeah. the Judds all the way to the chicks and all of these things that were so, you know, omnipresent in our lives on the radio, you know, uh, VH1 behind the music documentaries, you're just diving into the lives, honestly, of women, and to be clear, mostly white women. Um, but at least I was seeing themes I could relate to. Mm. And I feel like quite critical of country music now, particularly mainstream country music, mm. where we're really hearing a lot about women only belonging in pickup trucks, sitting beside a man in some little shorts with a koozie. Hmm. And like, that's not the message I want my daughter to hear. High Woman serves this message for, I think for everyone, frankly, yeah. yeah. It's a bit of a protest and it's a nice bonus that the songs are amazing and that you, you guys are so so good together. It's kind of an invitation too, you know, it's like a bus ticket. It's yeah. Like, come on, join the High Woman. Right, Tell right. your stories. Have you felt over the years, Brandy, excluded because you are a gay woman living in this world that, you know, it's Americana, but it is country. Yeah. Totally, from country music, yeah. but from many other genres, um, not in a conscious way. And I do sort of feel like I want to uh, shine a light in those corners to people that may not know that they're, that they're excluding other people, mm. you know? Because even I've excluded other people in my life, and until, I, until it was explained to me, until I understood that I wasn't making an effort, you know, to paint with a, with a broader brush, I didn't. And um, so I have faith in the genre that it can evolve.
You mentioned all these legends that you've worked with, with Joni Mitchell being the, the most extraordinary example recently at Newport, um, just this summer. Can you take us inside some of those jam sessions we hear about at her house where I think this idea was sort of born? Like, what's it like? Because we understand no cameras, no nothing. Yeah. Lock it down. She's like, park your pistols at the door. That's what she says. <laughs> <Does she? laughs> yeah. And so what's it like in there to the extent you can say publicly? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And it's, it's uh, unifying, you know, it's, it's not overly glamorous. It's um, very musical. Everyone's nervous. No mm. one's no one's famous. You can be sitting there with, you know, uh, Joni's neighbor and a friend from Canada and Harry Styles, and everyone's the same. You yeah. know, he's just as nervous as they are, and it's it, it's amazing because it, it, it sets a you set a bar for yourself. I set a bar for myself as a songwriter after the jam. I was saying to you earlier, I didn't realize it's been 20 years since you'd done a, a live show like that. Did it take any cajoling, or was this the plan? She she invites you over and says, "Hey, the voice is here. <laughs> if you want to hear it again, did you have to twist her arm at all, or was she excited to come to Newport with you?" There was a moment um, right before we left where I think that she had a, a, a she hesitated for a second. So we had a FaceTime, and I was like, "Joni, since you've introduced me to this group of people by allowing us to come together in your." living room and play our music for you, you know, and set these barometers for ourselves. Like you've created a, a family, a scene based on your living room, your recovery and your music. Mm. All we want to do is tribute you. So if you just sit there, let us sing to you and thank you. And she's like, I get the spirit of it now. I'll be there. You know, we're doing this. <laughs> and then she opened her mouth and sang every song. Yeah. <laughs> no one knew. Oh, is that right? That she was going to do that. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. She surprised you with how far she went with it. With, with how uh, far she went, how loud she sang, how yeah. confidently, how beautifully she sang when she stood up and played that guitar part. We'd all heard her fiddling around with it, but we had never heard her do it to that extent oh where gosh. it was just like an absolute triumph. And we were crying and like yeah. carrying on because we were just as moved as everybody else was and totally blown away. Is that a surreal thing for you to be able to even have a FaceTime with Joni Mitchell, to be invited to Joni Mitchell's house, to go on vacation with Elton John. It's something so wonderful, like no one deserves it. Mm -hmm. um, to sort of be in this place of like total awe, but then also don't fangirl out too much and freak out to the point where it looks like you don't belong here, you know? So you right. have to strike this balance right. in between. So I guess the best thing I can do is just have like enormous gratitude, but stay in my body so that I don't lose sight of the fact that this is happening to me in my life, you know? That's what. That's how I get to live here, yeah. right now. Does it ever strike you you've earned your place on vacation with Elton John? You've earned your place playing a guitar next to Joni Mitchell because of how extraordinarily talented you are. All my friends that are musicians and they're just in vans and they're just working so hard and they're so good and some of them are so much better than me. It's hard for me to be like, well, I've earned my place, but I do feel very proud of myself. What about the idea that the way you looked up to them now, there are young artists who say. I want to be Brandy Carlisle. I want to sing like that. I love oh, that. I want to. I want to perform the way she performs. What does that feel like? I believe it. I accept it. I take it all in. I accept the responsibility of it that comes with it, and um, it's what I always wanted. Hmm. And um, it's a, it's a distinct honor, especially people that are at risk, especially people that are underprivileged and that don't feel seen, or represented even in their own families or their schools or their church, like to know that they're looking at a concert or reading a book or listening to a record and going, there's another side to this. Hmm. You know, I get out of this eventually and maybe, maybe it's that for me. You know, I really relate to it. Well, that's the more profound piece of it, which the music is one thing. They want to be like you on stage, but the way you talk about Ellen DeGeneres, young kids and young women and young boys talk about you. That's got to kind of melt your brain a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I see them from stage and stuff too, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's like I get really excited in my head about it when I'm out on stage. I'm looking out at it, people, and I'm like, "Yep, that's me. That's me. That's uh, me. That's me. And that's me." <laughs> it's amazing. Quite a ride, yeah, right? It is quite a ride. Okay, so you've worked with almost everyone. I think you want to work with. Who's still out there? Do we need to send a signal right now to someone? <sighs> I've really been thinking about this lately. Do you know what it is? is that Elton John's been my greatest hero since I was 11 years old. 
was a major turning point in my life in almost every way that, that a person can affect another person. But I still have never got to perform with Elton John. Never? No. Oh. Can't we just make that happen? That's what we got to do. I mean, but we don't know because the tour, you know, it's like, when's he going to be? So, oh. yeah. I think he may show up at one of your shows. Mm. I'm going to put that in the atmosphere. Well, maybe I'll show up to a couple more of his. Mm. This, I feel like this is already happening and this is, you're very good at like just planting a seed. <laughs> That's what I wonder sometimes. <laughs> Has it already happened? Do I just really want it to happen or did it happen in some other dimension? There's that confidence again. It's yeah. going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> Congratulations on your success. It's so great to talk to you. Oh, nice. It was really nice to talk to you yeah. too. What a great interview. Huge Thank fan. You. Huge Thank fan. You. First of all, it's so good to see you. When you walk in, it's like sunshine has arrived in our little dark room. It's your season, Christmas is here. So question first, is your Christmas tree up? Oh, of course, my Christmas tree was up before Thanksgiving. We, yeah. And the day after Thanksgiving, we turned all the Christmas lights on in my yard, in my house. I mean, yeah, so I'm always about Christmas. Now, I have, one, wait. I have one other question for you. When do you take all of those Christmas decorations down? The first down? week after, uh, at first of the year. So you feel Sometime like that's... Sometime within that year, yeah. I'm already going. Sometimes I'll keep a few little things. My birthday's the 19th of January. Of course. Sometimes I'll keep a few little things in the house. Just think, well, I'll celebrate my birthday with, with a little tree, maybe in one room or Sweet. so. Sweet. <laughs> you, you've had so many Christmas memories since you were a little girl to today. Is there a Christmas that kind of stands out to you? Like, a lot of people say it was maybe before, even before all the fame and before all that. Like, is there one that sticks out to you and you say that Christmas. Well, that memory I actually made a movie of called Circle of Love. That was when my mom and dad had been married for years, had a house full of kids, and mom had never had a wedding ring because they married when they were 15 and 17 years old. So I remember all of us making up money to help buy mom a wedding ring, mm -hmm. and we all got to be part of that and remembering how special that was back there in the country and mama, you know, being so happy and surprised about a ring and it made a wonderful story. But I have tons, tons of memories. A little yeah. brother that was born around Christmas time because we always wanted our walking, talking dolls. Mm -hmm. Mama said, well, you got one that really pees and really cries <laughs> and really does all the stuff that you're wanting that little doll to do. Here you are. So I have a lot of precious memories being from the country and, you know, being back back oh. in the backwoods where you make your own fun, you make your own Christmas. And you make your own memories. Boy, yeah. you got some good ones. I want to talk about that, but I want to talk about this movie that you have out called Dolly Parton's Mountain Magic Christmas. This is all parts of you. <gasps> Dolly Parton, Christmas, Dolly I'm starting to cry just thinking about it. It's got all your friends. It's a beautiful story of putting on a show. It's a musical. It's a movie. When I saw it, I was like, that is so Dolly. That's all of it. Well, we're so excited about the, the movie. And of course, we did it at Dollywood, mm -hmm. which is my theme park up in mm -hmm. East Tennessee, where I was born and raised. It's like a, a movie set anyway, some sure. of everything. And so we invited all these wonderful guests, like Jimmy Fallon, uh -huh. uh, you know, who's on the show. And so we've had all these great you know, people on and great actors. We did a show about, a, it's like a show within a show, because mm -hmm. I think people are real interested in knowing what goes on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So we made it where we really made it like how the show was going on, all the things that can go wrong behind the scenes, but then we actually did the numbers as if they were rehearsals, getting ready to actually do it live sort of thing. So it's a lot of drama, it's a lot of comedy, a lot of meaningful songs, a lot of meaningful places, stuff for kids, you know, we got sing-alongs with the kids, so, uh, and getting to do it at home was I, great for me. I mean, the list of celebrities is pretty amazing. It's Willie Nelson, it's Jimmy Allen, it's your goddaughter, Miley Cyrus. Cyrus. And, her, and her daddy, And her Billy daddy, Cyrus. Billy, Billy, <laughs> Billy Ray. 
And we've got Jimmy Fallon. I mean, the list is it like, is wow, wow, Zach wow. Zach Williams doing our great Grammy Come winning on. song. There was Jesus, which is perfect for oh. the show. And so, yeah, we got the Fallons and the Allens. And and we and Willie, it was a dear thing to me to get to work with Willie again. We've been friends since we were both fairly young in Nashville. Was it so fun? It, it seemed to me, there are a lot of sets that seem like work, but this thing seemed different to me when I was watching it. Because I, I, I got to see uh, parts of this already, and it looked electric, like you'd want to see this on Broadway kind of thing. Oh, well, good, and you might. <laughs> but I had a lot of my family participate, sure. a couple of my sisters, Cassie and Rachel, a lot of my nieces, my little grandnephew, Liam, plays the little elf. And so we've just got all kinds of stars, all kinds of wonderful actors playing the parts of the people behind the scenes. So you and Jimmy Fallon have a song. It's called Almost Too Early for Christmas. Okay, you heard the song. What was the first thing you thought when you heard it? It's almost too early for Christmas. Why don't we see how it goes? Well, I, first of all, there was a little backstory to okay, that. Jimmy me. was going to be on my Christmas show. He said, let me send you the song and see what you think. And he sent that to me, though, like in September. And so it was called Too Early for Christmas. I thought, wow. What a great idea for a yeah. song. It's almost too early for Christmas because the Halloween decorations are still out and the Christmas haters and all. So he <laughs> sent me the song, and I just loved it. He said, would you sing on it with me? Because we'd done Mariah Carey's song in my Christmas album of All I Want for Christmas is You. Yeah. So I knew he could sing good, and we sounded good <laughs> together. I just love him, and he sings great. He's just an all-around great guy. Isn't he? I know, and y'all sitting in that booth singing that song was so cute. Oh, I loved I it. Know. I loved it. It's so cute, yeah. Yeah. back home for just a minute, if you wouldn't mind. So you were uh, the fourth child in your family of mm -hmm. how many kids? Well, there's 12. Mom and Daddy had 12 children, six boys and six girls. Mm -hmm. And so we had a big, big family and we lived back in the woods, but we had a good time. And, you know, we just loved each other. And Christmas, we made Christmas, whatever. We made it. Mama was always great to make everything seem fun and happy and made things more exciting than they were. And so we just <laughs> did what all country people do. We made the most of it. One of my favorite questions to ask somebody, because I feel it's it's such a window into their life, is close your eyes for a second. Okay. And then imagine your childhood bedroom. Look around. See what around you see. In, with my eyes closed? I'm with looking, your, what okay, am look, I looking look, for? You're, you're just looking at your room. and Or <laughs> who, who was okay. with you in your room? Were there anything on the walls? Were there multiple <laughs> kids? What, where did you sleep? Like, what was that childhood Actually, bedroom Actually, I don't have to close my eyes okay. to see that room. <laughs> because me. we, you know, in the early days, you know, we, we lived a few different places. But in the early days, you know, we, our house was really small. And mom and daddy had a little separate area where they slept, but we mostly just piled up. We had two or three beds, and we had three or four kids sleeping in, in bed, and some of them peed in the bed, and we just dealt with that, too, and it was cold in the winter. We'd fan the cover, get cold with that, but anyway, I just we just loved with Daddy get up building the fire in the mornings. And, you know, Daddy, is the fire hot? You know, is the fire hot? <laughs> That's Mom what y'all said? Yeah, and so we didn't, he wouldn't let us get up till the house was warm because it was cold in our old houses. But anyway, I just remember things hanging on the wall would be like a picture of Jesus 
or those little two little kids, two little orphans crossing a bridge, and you know those famous little pictures you see, yeah. the Lord's Supper in the kitchen hanging on the wall, and or coats and hats and whatever. But we just lived a simple rural life, like so many country people do. But but it was a house full of love and, and warmth. And so even though it was cold outside, it was warm mm. in our hearts. Who, who taught you about generosity? Oh, that was, I, that, I'm from a faith-based family. Yeah. My grandpa yeah. was a preacher. So when you grow up like that, you, you're supposed to, it's better to give than receive. Although as kids, we, we loved getting the presents, you know, whatever we got. But I think you, I just always had a, a giving spirit, the same as my mom. And my dad were just good-hearted country people. Did you remember witnessing it, or was it just part of life? It was part of life. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was, it was the way you survived in the country. Everybody yeah. had to help everybody else. If it was hog-killing time, the neighbors knew who, who, whose day that was, or if they would go help somebody in the crops. If it was, you know, if, you were, if your tobacco crop was money, which ours was, yeah. different neighbors would come to help, and they worked at different times. So it was just what, how you survive in the country, and I think you just kind of learn to do that, and that just follows you all the days of your life. Faith is such a big part of your life. When would you say that your faith was tested the most? Well, I think we all go through things in yeah. our lives, and I don't know for certain. There's been several times people always, and, and I talk about that in the special, people always act like I'm sort of an angel. I say, I'm no angel. I just play one on TV. <laughs> it's tough out there. I just try hard, and I try no matter what I'm going through, and we all go through all sorts of things, but I just try to rely on that faith mm. and believe that through God all things are possible mm. and that I'm going to survive and that I can survive because I have faith to do it. And a lot of people depend on me. And there's a saying in Scripture, I believe, that says, to whom much is given, much is required, mm -hmm. or much is expected. So anytime I get to you know, feeling too far down or feeling too sorry for myself, I just think about that and think, well, God has blessed me in so many ways, so why am I going to wallow around in my little dab mm -hmm. of sorrow? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. When uh, the holidays are festive, and I want to talk about all that, but it also does bring back memories for a lot of people. And in the country music world, Loretta Lynn and Naomi Judd passed oh, wow. th this just, just over these past months. And loss is something that people deal with differently. And I just was curious how you deal with loss, like, of them. Well, those things are very special. Like with Loretta, I, she was very dear to me, like a sister. Same with uh, Naomi. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we, we were same age, and we loved the same things. And I loved her. And then I also lost Kenny Rogers, mm -hmm. three of my dearest mm -hmm. people in the business in a very short period of time. And I grieve over them almost like you do a family member. Mm -hmm. And I think of them, and but you try to keep the good memories. You don't try to try to dwell. You're sorrowful, of course, of the loss and when it happens. But then you allow yourself to just think of all the things that you remember about them that is added to your life, mm -hmm. and remember what they did for all the millions of people, that, the lives that they touched. And so you just think you're just thankful that you got to know them. And that you got to share that time, like you said. There's that old song you talked about memories. Mm -hmm. There's that, that old mm -hmm. song of precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul, how they linger ever near me. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. and then it's like the line I love in that song is precious memories, unseen angels mm -hmm. sent from somewhere to my soul. And I think about that. You know, like those precious memories. They're like they just flow in and out of you, and mm -hmm. you remember special things Ooh. about them. And so I love that line in that song. Oh my God, that's so beautiful. I feel very weepy. Yeah. I don't know why. I think oh, well, just I listening. Like to, that's just a beautiful touches. line. Yeah. And that's how it feels, you know, like the unseen angels. And you feel like they're still all around you. You feel and that? you feel them, yeah. Mm. Boy, that's so beautiful. I feel like the other, there's so many magical parts about you, but it's that you keep um, you are evolving through life. And I've listened to Miley Cyrus, your goddaughter, say, I learned this from Dolly, I learned that from Dolly, I learned this from Dolly. <laughs> But then I was wondering, what is she teaching you? What are you learning about life from Miley? Well, I'm just learning Miley <laughs> as we go. Yeah. Well, I love Miley. And, I, you know, even when Miley goes through Miley's things, when back when she was making her transition from the Hannah Montana mm -hmm. little thing, trying to get to grow up, and yeah. people were not allowing her that. And, and, I would, and they were telling me, you better talk to Miley. I said, look, 
You will never have me saying nothing bad about Molly because Molly is so gifted, so talented, so smart. Sure. I love her. Like you love your child, you watch them grow and you love to see them blossom. And so I just, I've watched her and I'm, I really admire her, her talent mm -hmm. and how she conducts herself. She knows who she is. She does. And she's doing it her she? way. I've always done it my way. And I hope she learned a little bit of that from me. Yeah. That be you. It's like I say to her, you be you and I'll be me. And together, you know, we'll be us and that'll be a beautiful thing. And uh, she was on my Christmas show, as sure. you mentioned. And then I'm also uh, hosting. I know. The, uh, yeah, her oh. New Year's eat party from Miami. And so we're so excited about that because Lord what knows is what's going to happen then. I was going to say, you and Miley hosting a New Year's Eve special yeah. is like the perfect combination. I so think what so is going to go down? Give me a little. We don't know. You don't know? We're going to do a couple of skits and we're going to do a, <laughs> a song, a couple of songs, maybe do something with Def Leppard, Wait, uh, a rock song. Well, you know, I'm now a rock star. <laughs> So I'm going to sing a little something with them, and we're going to do a couple of a duets, some, some medleys, and we might even sing Jolene, you know, toward the end. But uh, we're, I don't know how much I should tell without Molly kicking my butt, because I don't know how much it's going to be a surprise. I do basically know what we're doing. Okay. But there's so much of us that's hosting that will just be us being yeah. us, and no scripts, no nothing. I'm sure we'll have some guidelines that we'll have to follow yeah. for the timing. But yeah, sure. I have no idea what we're going to wear, which I'm going to probably be a little more bold than of normal. Of course. You've and got Molly to. is always bolder than normal. So I, I think it's going to be fun. Will and from Miami. From Miami. Will there be cocktails or are you a no cocktail person? Oh, well, at, at New Year's Eve? Yeah. Uh, whether I was or whether I wasn't, <laughs> I'm going to have a, a shine girl moonshine cocktail. <laughs> Let's talk about Rock, Miss Rockstar. I'm sorry, but that moment at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, when Pink introduced you and you stood up on that stage. It is my pleasure to induct you into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And you said, like, I'm a rock star now. Star now. I loved it. But you know what struck me? In the very beginning when they said, Dolly, we want you to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I wasn't clear whether you were like, well, I don't sing rock and roll, so I don't want to be in there, or if you felt unworthy of something like that. Which, which That's one what was I it? felt. See, because I don't follow all that. You know, I, yeah. I, I have, I, you know, I've often 
done some rock and roll things or rock, you know, covered some rock uh -huh. and roll songs, but I never thought of myself as a, a rock star. When people say, oh, you're a rock star, you know, that was just them saying, oh, you're cool or whatever. You know right. how people say, ah, you're a rock star. But my husband loves rock and roll, but I'm, you know, I've just done everything in country and I know how hard you work at your craft. Sure. And when they, they said they wanted to put me in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, there were so many other people, I also thought that they just voted on that and it was like that person was going to go in. And I thought, I am not taking any votes from any of these people that spend their lives doing that like I spend my life doing this. Yeah. And so I found out later that they give it to you for if you've influenced other people. And other, you know, I found out more about it. Mm -hmm. But I had said at the start I didn't want to, to accept it because I didn't think I'd earned it. Mm. And still ain't sure. <laughs> but I thought, well, time is good. You know me, I'm about time. And I thought, well, if they're going to give it to me anyhow, I'm going to accept it gracefully. Oh. And then I'm going to go ahead and do a rock album and just make the most of it. Okay, Carl Dean, your husband of 56 years, um, he loves rock and roll. So is he thrilled that you're doing a rock album? Well, he's praying for me, I think. <laughs> I guess he's hoping I can pull it off, but I really think it's some of the best work I've ever done. I think wait, I've already done it. For real? I've already been working on it. It's going to come out next fall. Wait, wait, wait. The best work you've ever done? I think so. Only because it's different for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I worked, you know, I wanted it to be good. I didn't want anybody to be able to criticize me too much. They might, anyhow. But I really think people might be surprised because I've loved these songs for years. Yeah. And the songs that I chose, I chose a lot of the songs he loved. And then some that I loved, and I wrote a few things too. And Kent Wells, my longtime uh, musical director, band leader, guitar player, uh, he produced it. I just knew he was right because he's always kind of he's got mm -hmm. that inner rock, rock and roll in him. Sure. So he did a wonderful job, and we used all these great rock musicians. And I'm going to have a lot of the uh, iconic singers join me on several of the That's songs. Cool. Well, I'm asking, yes. but Pat Benatar is going to join me on something, and Pink is going to join me Pink. on, don't you love, love. that? I did great songs like uh, uh, Purple Rain, mm. did my version of a lot of songs that I love, that people love, so I've got a lot of word out to a lot of people, so we'll see who winds up on it. You know what, this is so cool. I'm sitting here listening to you, and you're doing something for the first time. People don't often do something for the, for the first time, but you, I feel like, you get out of your comfort zone. You're like, I do this and now I'm gonna do that. Like, will you tell me about that part of your life? Well, I just work whatever feels right. You know, I've always kind of just rolled like a river. You know, I just let the let it flow. I just kind of yeah. let God lead me, so to speak. And it just seems to be the right time to do certain things. And here I am at 77 years old. On, Next girl. year when I come out, I'm gonna be a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> for a minute, but I really, I gave it, I give it all I got, whatever it is. And so I did not want to be embarrassed by doing a rock album. So I really gave it all I had and I'm just hopeful that people are going to, well, hopefully they'll just accept it because they Love put it. me in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> so if I'm going to be there, I'm going to, I will feel like, you know, I feel like I need to earn it. So uh -huh. this is my contribution back to say thank you for putting me in there. So now maybe, you know, I can rest rest easy that I might have earned it.
Jeff Bezos recognized wow. that he thought he was going to give one of his huge grants to you to distribute for your charities. What did you make of it when you got well, the call from you Jeff know, Bezos? Well, you know, it happened. Same day that I was being inducted into the Hall of Fame, I got a call saying Jeff Bezos uh, wants to speak to you, and here's his number. He wants. He's at home waiting for you to call. So and I thought, what is he calling me for? I thought maybe they wanted me to do a commercial for Amazon or <laughs> something. You know, I thought, well, that's weird. But, of course, out of respect, you call. And uh, then we talked for a little bit. And then when he, he told me, I said, are you telling me that you're giving me $100 million for, for my charities? And he said, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. No strings attached except that it all has to go to, sure. you know, charity. And I started to cry on the phone. And it was just really like, I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a little, you know, I, it really moved me. I mean, it just to think that I was thinking, you know, what a generous thing to do. And then I was just thinking of all the great things that I could do for so many needy people. And I just thought, wow, thank you, God. You know, and it was like, um, it was amazing. It was, it was just out of nowhere. And just, I, I guess you can imagine what a wonderful day that was, getting put in the Hall of Fame and then also getting that. Because I spent about $1,000 buying tickets for the lottery for that $2 billion <laughs> A lottery thing, and then of course I didn't win any of that. And then I, that same day I won, you know, not won. I felt like I'd won the lottery by, you know, getting that hundred million dollars to help all these wonderful causes. But I really think whether it's his money or whoever's money, I think if you're in a position to help, you should, and you you should choose things close to your heart that you can be proud of to represent and be out there and feel good about what you've done. So it's you're supposed to help one another. Can I ask you the most basic of questions? Why do you sing? Why do I sing? Because I can't help it. <laughs> I mean, that's who I am. That's what I do. I was, my grandpa said I came out uh, crying in the key of D, so they named me Dolly. <laughs> but anyway, that music is a big part of my family. It's just, it is in my DNA. And so I sing because that song, I sing because I'm happy, you know. I sing because I'm free. I sing, you know, because I have every reason in this world to sing. And so I love it, and that's what I do. Well, you don't do it for the money, and you don't do it for the fame. I know that for sure, because I, I feel I would like do it without the fame and the money. I've always said I yeah. would, if I worked as a waitress, because I love to sing and write, I'd be saving my tips to make demo records, to send to Nashville, to try to get my songs recorded, or be singing in the local bar or at the county fair or wherever I could. I'm certain that I would sing no matter what my life would have been. Let's talk New Year's resolution since this is, you are coming up on this Miley, the special with Miley Cyrus. What, what do you have on your list? Well, I'm like everybody else. You know, you make a bunch of resolutions and you never keep them. No. Third weekend of January, that's just all forgotten. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I hope, my hopes for the new year is I think what all good-hearted, faith-based people are just good. You don't even have to be faith-based, just good people are hoping for a little more kindness, a little more love, a little more trying to pull together instead of falling apart. And one of the songs I wrote for my rock album is called The World's On Fire. And it's oh. about that whole, you know, liar, liar, the world's on fire. What you gonna do when it all burns down? Liar, liar, the world's on fire. But we still got time to turn it all around. It's like an anthem and it's all about what's going on. And, it's, uh, and so that's what I'm hoping and praying for that in the new year that we can try a little harder. We've been through so much with the pandemic all over the world, though, with just the weather and all the, yeah. you know, just the scary stuff, the scary earthquakes stuff. and things. It's just, you just think, well, you got to think positive. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this Christmas show, mm -hmm. because I felt like I needed to help, if I could, to bring some brightness and lift people's hearts up a little bit and, and really just, uh, you know, sing some songs that are, meaningful, tell some stories that are fun, and just take people's minds off of that. But I'm just hoping that next year and the year after and the years to come that we can, we've learned a little bit about what's going on and how long can we go, you know, like that. Can't we rise above? Can't we show some love? Can't we just lift up and, you know, just help, help each other out? You know, it's like, one of those things, can't we just, you know, move on? And we we all feel the same. We cry, we hurt, we bleed, we suffer. You yeah. know, we all want, yeah. you know, we all want to, you know, things for ourselves. But Lord, why can't we just 
pray about it and think about it. And even if you're not even, a, like I say, a faith-based person, you've got to believe in good. And just like in yes. my show when I said, you know, a lot of people don't believe, you know, in in heaven. I would say, well, I do. And if I, if there is a heaven, I hope to hell I go. And I'm going to be working at it, you know, trying to get there because I'm going to try my best to try to bring as much joy as I can and lift people up as much as I can in my way. And I just think we all need to try a little harder. I don't care what our politics or our religion or our color or anything else. We need to try a little harder. So that's that's my personal New Year's resolution, to try a little harder myself, to try to make as much of that happen as I can through songs or through giving or through whatever it may be. Val, you're such a delight. It's such an awesome human being. I mean, well, so are you, and thank you. Like I say, I ain't all, I ain't all that, but I appreciate the compliment. And I've got a lot of wonderful people in my life that help me look really good. So I always like to thank them for it. So I just get to get out here and take a lot of credit for a lot of hard work that a lot of other people do. But we're getting it done, and that's the main thing. Love you. Yeah, thank you. Season's greetings, everyone. The holidays are upon us, and we are ready to celebrate right here on Today All Day. From tips for that turkey to cooking up your very first holiday spread, we have got you covered. So tune in to Today All Day, all season long. everyone the holidays are upon us and we are ready to celebrate right here on today all day from tips for that turkey to cooking up your very first holiday spread we have got you covered so tune in to today all day all season long savannah you got to catch up with one of 